what I have on for today is review hearing regarding the guardian litem review. Uh, so Ms. Fellows, what can you tell me? Yes, um, I sent out an email to your honor and to the attorneys late yesterday afternoon. I'm not sure if everyone received it. Um, just kind of updating, because I know that your honor likes to have kind of a brief um, outline of what's gonna happen or what the recommendations are gonna be. Um, so yes, I have, since I was appointed, I have met with both parents, um, did the intakes, did their interviews face-to-face. -face. I also did meet with the boys at their schools um, last week. Um, I have um, requested out for CPS records so they could be a good 60 to 90 days out. Um, I will be accessing records from Cartini <clears throat> um, and hopefully Kaiser here shortly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so in essence to what the issues are at hand and what the court has been concerned about is about the boys and their contact with their fathers, I believe what the court was was wanting some information about. <clears throat> um, Nathan, who is the oldest, who is 17, will be 18 um, September 1st. So that's a little less than seven months out. Um, he would like to see his dad more. Um, he would like flexibility with what the visitation should look like. Right now, it's two hours, basically every other weekend. Um, it's been on Sundays. Um, and he would like to see his dad more, um, but would like the flexibility instead of it being just kind of like set every other weekend like it was before. Um, and the flexibility should be around like his sporting events. Um, he is in sports basically year round. Um, and he has like other things um, high school dances, just different things like that. So that was his request. Um, and I don't have a problem with that from my perspective as the guardian ad litem. He is old enough. Uh, I don't see any issues with that. As for Liam, Liam is the major point of concern. Um, he has ARFID, which is um, an eating disorder, um, a very serious eating disorder. Um, when I went to go speak with him last week, he did say that he missed his dad and he really wa he wants to see his dad, is, is point blank, he wants to see his dad. Um, but he doesn't want any talk about what he said, conspiracy theories about, talk about his medication or medication um, hurting someone like himself. Um, he, I did ask him about the contract, um, the contract that the court has had great issues with. I, as the guard, issues with that contract as well. Um, main, a number of, of issues, but putting the boys into the middle, um, basically really looking at the contract and what it spells out is the father is dissing, dismissing um, Liam's care plan um, and basically tearing it apart. And that, that's not okay. Um, it puts the boys in the middle as and is extremely concerning regarding the health and welfare of Liam. Um, when I asked Liam about signing it, he says, yeah, he was he was forced to and he just signed it to get over it, to get over with it. Um, and I basically left the conversation there um, to back up just a little bit. I did ask Nathan as well about the contract, and he also said that he just signed it just to get over just get it over with. Um, but back to Liam, um, because of the significant concerns that I have about dad, dad's inability to accept dad's, um, just how he presents um, and putting his boys in the middle, um, being dismissive of Liam's care plan, um, even with all of the medical providers who have, um, he's, that have been involved in this case. Um, it's one thing for a parent to have questions and to do research regarding um, different and other um, ways to deal with issues and what have you. It's totally different to try to indoctrinate or convince their child in direct opposition to that care plan. That's a significant issue, concern, and risk to the um, health and well-being of Liam. So after reviewing um, the contract numerous times and just kind of 
sitting there reviewing it, that's precisely what it appears to be. So therefore, at this point, I am not recommending that there be any contact between Liam and his father at this point in time. I'm not comfortable or confident in his ability to do and say the appropriate things. Um, I firmly believe that he needs to start from ground zero, um, basically go back to Cartini, um, basically relearn everything. Um, why things unfolded from August of 2020 when Kaiser doctor said that Liam did not have an eating disorder to basically 2022. There was a lot of testing and things like that done. And they did um, diagnose him with an eating disorder. And um, then Cartini became involved. He was referred to Cartini, which is an inpatient um, eating disorder facility um, in the Portland area. So there's just not, there's a clear, it's clear. Dad doesn't understand. Dad isn't willing to see it. Um, and how it affects EM and the case plan. And, and again, I keep going back to the contract because that is something tangible um, that dad did, that there's no argument about that. Um, and even though, you know, he has apologized and said that from the standpoint is that he knows that he should not have done that. I don't believe that he understands the impact that it had on Liam. And the fact that, the, excuse me, the paragraph that says that Liam is obese, how could anyone con even conceive that Liam is obese? And to have his son sign such a thing that says, and, and basically he's like admitting I'm obese. Um, my understanding is that Liam had an extreme hard time after that. Um, so that's where I'm at on that. I have since, um, I did that, that information and, and sent out that email late yesterday afternoon, um, I realized that there was another document that was filed under seal um, on November 17th of 2023. This includes a four page document from Cartini, from Dr. Rao, who is a uh, child and adolescent psychiatrist that is on Liam's case. It is the first document that's behind the um, cover letter, cover sheet of that filing. And it's one of the things that he has put in here in the second paragraph is that it's important to note that Liam's case is one of the most severe and chronic I have seen in terms of impact on the body. That struck me. The entire letter did, and it and it absolutely substantiates what I had come up with with just looking through the information I have at this point in time. The last has to do with the father, um, and Dr. Rao said, "I generally believe that Liam's father has his best interest in mind, um, but I also believe that he has demonstrated a formal." lack of capacity to make medical decisions for his son. His father shows consistent difficulty in understanding the severe nature of his son's medical presentation, let alone his psychiatric presentation, the short and long-term risks of failure to thrive and ability weigh risks and benefits of medications and non-medication interventions. Um, Mr. Stevens seems to struggle with the retention of certain facts of illness and intervention, as well as understanding consequences of delay in treatment interruptions of nutrition and how his own language and behavior affect his son. Perhaps most significant, Liam's desire for treatment and own understanding of his illness and what he must do to get healthy are opposed to his father. That says it all. And that's where I'm at, is that I don't believe that the father has an understanding of Liam's medical treatment of Liam's diagnosis. And so therefore that's one of the reasons why I'm not recommending any kind of contact at this point in time. Since reading that letter last night and again this morning, um, I would like to have another review set in maybe about 30 days because I would like to talk to Dr. Rao, who is the one that wrote this letter. Um, there's also a Dr. Moshtal from Cartini, who is the medical director um, and I would like to talk to that person as well, um, because in essence, 
I, I'm not exactly sure where to go from here. Um, like I said, ground zero is to me the place where dad needs to start again to really delve into it and accept it and be willing to hear and have an open mind. But I also need to hear from the professionals that have already dealt with him how they see that working. Um, and so I would like to be able to reach out to them to, to kind of get an idea um, and be able to go forward from there. Because as a GAL, I would like to see there be some kind of contact between Liam and his dad but it needs to be healthy. It needs to be safe. It needs to be in Liam's best interest. Um, so that's where I am on that, Your Honor. Um, one other piece is that I would like our family wizard to be ordered to be used by both parents. Um, the mom has asked the dad way back as, as far back as in 2022. She has been on our family wizard. Um, dad has refused or has to me said that he cannot get online the app. Um, I have told him to go instead of using the app on the phone um, to go ahead and go through the actual Our Family Wizard website and sign on, log in that way. Um, I have not checked this morning, but he has not done so um, as of late yesterday afternoon. Mom did give me professional access, so I do have access to the Our Family Wizard so I can kind of monitor that. Um, but there's absolutely no reason why dad should not be able to get onto that communication platform. Um, that would be an excellent way for any doctor's appointments, any um, information regarding Liam or Nathan, um, their schedules um, and what have you, um, that they can communicate that way. That is what I have at this point, Your Honor, if you have questions. Thank you. And thank you for sending that email. I did receive it and I did review it last night. So thank you for doing that. Uh, with that, uh, we have Mr. Zandi here in the courtroom and Mr. Roberts online. Mr. Zandi. I appreciate that, Your Honor. Um, information was received uh, yesterday afternoon. I did discuss that with my client uh, this morning prior to court order or that email uh, yesterday upon receipt. So we're, we're ready and willing to move forward today. I think where Liam is concerned, it largely speaks for itself. If Your Honor recalls, this is the case where we made the argument of being a life and death uh, matter and situation. But we spent significant time on that contract. We spent significant time on the medical information that's all been, been presented. And I think we're in a place now where we're largely treading water, just like unfortunately my client's done since the divorce was filed out of Clark County back in 2014. We have a lot of information and we forwarded that to the GAO. We've tried to be as concise as possible with it. Uh, but at the end of the day, Liam is doing significantly better in February than he was in early December. And uh, we, we entered that restraining order. So that's the positive. Uh, so I, I, we are in full agreement that uh, visitation and contact between dad and Liam uh, remain limited and cease uh, as it has been because the child is doing well. And that's the good news of this case. As it pertains to Nathan, uh, and again, we certainly realize that this child is 17 years old. And we realize that both kids ideally want to have a relationship with dad. I think that's tremendous. Uh, unfortunately, I think these kids have been kind of a group into a relationship with dad that is wholly destructive. And that's not just Liam, but that's Nathan as well. We gave you information uh, related not only to Liam, but Nathan, uh, which raises significant concerns. And uh, we gave you information that again, like Liam, uh, Mr. Uh, Stevens will do anything to sabotage uh, issues with Nathan as well. Uh, Nathan has certain issues that need to be accounted for. Uh, Nathan has uh, behavioral issues in the past uh, that were, again, largely dismissed, not only dismissed by dad, but actually encouraged. Uh, we gave you information about what happened back in the fall related to an episode at home in which dad is encouraging the child to uh, act up, is encouraging the child to fight the stepdad. We have more of these types of communications uh, that, again, are absolutely toxic to the child and doesn't consider the well-being of these children. We also have the fact, and this is it kind of dovetails with the issues with Liam when it comes to the medical decision making. Uh, Nathan, for a period of time, had some thoughts of self-harm. This was a couple of years ago. Uh, Nathan was prescribed anxiety medication, counseling, and, and pills to, to treat that. And dad essentially said, well, I'm not giving them those because, again, uh, you're fine. Uh, basically, uh, be tough and just, just ignore it. Uh, so we've got those issues. We've got the issues with sports. And again, that's problematic. We've got a 17-year-old child who's heavily vested uh, in extracurricular activities, uh, who has a sense of accomplishment with that. We gave you information at the last hearing in which dad would show up to the games and make uh, – an absolute atrocity of himself uh, in which he would yell at the participants. He would make uh, slurs about politics and, and the like uh, and act in a completely demeaning manner to the point where the coach had to essentially say, please stop during the middle of the game. People are moving away from him during the middle of the game. 
These are not the actions of someone who's healthy. It's a case where Nathan then gets inside the car and uh, addresses the issues, clearly embarrassed as any child, I think he was 14 or 15 at the time, uh, that would be embarrassed by the actions of a parent who's making the focus solely on them as opposed to being a support system for their teenage child. Uh, so this goes beyond Liam, this goes to both children, and this is a pattern of conduct that just wasn't a line switch that was flipped overnight. This has gotten worse and worse and worse. And although this child, when Nathan is going to be 18 in September, we still have six months that we've got to kind of foster through. I think just assuming, well, he's 17 and he misses his dad. He's seeing his dad, by the way. Go back to the every other weekend. I think especially during the context and some of the, the pressure of going through litigation is setting us up potentially to fail or have more problems over those six months until the child ages out. I think we take a conservative approach. And I think we continue with kind of the path that we're on until such time. And I think it's certainly after the information from Cartini, the declarations and information provided to you in the file, the information from the GAL here today, this guy is in desperate need of a mental health evaluation. I think that is uh, important. I don't have an issue with Ms. Fellows' a suggestion that we set this over 30 days so she can do more investigation. This is a very broad investigation and there's a lot of information there. We would like some assurance that dad is not a danger to these kids any more than he's already shown that he is. I think a mental health evaluation would go a very, very long way in alleviating some of those concerns or alternatively showing us on what kind of level we're dealing with here and what the magnitude of this is. So we are asking for that. We're asking you to do that right away. Now, we would like in that 30-day review some kind of proof that he's actually met with a mental health evaluator with input from the GAL as well as my client. Again, this is somebody who flatly contradicts the doctor to their face. It's not just behind the scenes with the kids. You've got the information from Dr. Rao that says, and other providers, dad would come in and I don't like the word obnoxious, but dad would come in and be obnoxious with them. He would uh, talk over them. He would silence the screen and talk with his wife while they're giving uh, information about the children. This is the type of conduct we have. I don't know what that stems from, but I do think a mental health evaluation will hopefully let us uh, see kind of what the level of magnitude uh, of any issues are with it. We're in complete agreement with our family wizard. I would like, and my client has tried that, we'll remind the court that there is a long-term restraining order in effect out of Clark County for 80 years. It actually never expires. Never expires, lifelong uh, restraining order. Uh, so our family wizard, again, my client gave you information at the initial hearing about trying to communicate with Mr. Stevens. He disputed that. And from what you heard from the GAL today, it's right on board with my client, unfortunately, detailed for you. This is an individual who works uh, in technology, who has uh, a career around computers, who you saw the Facebook post, the social media post, this guy is well versed in technology. And now all of a sudden he comes forward and says, oh, I can't log on to our family wizard even though it's been at least two years uh, since that was that was asked. Of me. Again, it just kind of flies in the face of reason and it kind of fits the whole narrative of unfortunately the way this case is going. My clients are certainly willing to continue in that uh, effect. I think that's appropriate given the tone and nature of the emails that these two have sent back and forth that we've provided for you, and we agree with that. We are asking, again, that sole decision-making be reaffirmed. I think that's for everything. I think that's extracurricular. I think that's uh, education. And I most certainly think that that's medical. If ever there was a case that required sole decision-making to one parent or the other, it's this one. And again, it alarms me when you look at the letter from Cartini, and, and this is the part that uh, Ms. Fellows did not state, but again, this, again, I think summarizes it very succinctly. Doctor says, Liam is not only small for his age, but his actual bone age is three years behind his chronological age, despite normal growth hormone. He has delayed puberty. This means his nutrition has been so poor that his, bo his body stopped maturing entirely. He goes on to state that not only is he small, but he's pretty much off the charts. He's in the one percentile for kids his age. And then we have a dad who thinks, in all of his infinite wisdom, well, I'm going to have my kid sign a contract that says he's obese. And not only am I going to do that, I'm going to tell him that the treatment records he's been getting are wrong and that Cartini is wrong. That is all in his head. And oh, by the way, I'm going to have his 17 year old brother uh, sign as a witness to this. Again, the emotional toll and impact of that I don't think can be understated. And, and that's kind of the position we're at. Dad's got a long way to go. I hope he can get there. But at this point, without a mental health evaluation, I'm of absolutely zero confidence that he will. And at this point, it's protecting the kids. It's moving forward on the trajectory we're on. Also, asking again, this is getting expensive. I've been attempting to keep the cost down for my client. He threw in a GAL. You throw in a uh, repeat hearings and you throw in the actions of dad and the fact that we're here because he just can't seem to make the most basic fundamental parenting decision for his kids and we are asking for an award of fees and costs i will ask for that again because i think this is a case that probably deserves it that's where we're at but, but ultimately today i think we proceed with caution with nathan we continue with those limited visits we do agree that uh, dad during this time uh, if the court is going to expand that uh, takes him as responsible for going to the extracurricular activities 
maybe Nathan some input again because he is 17 and a half years old. I think that's appropriate. Uh, but but dad needs to again stay out of this stuff. Uh, suggesting to the kids and suggesting to doctors that soybeans make one gay is problematic. And, and that's again just kind of the overall theme we have from this guy that he says in his own very uncertain terms through his social media posts and his declarations to this court comments to my clients and most importantly comments to the kids. Remind me, dad is having two hours every other two hours every other week, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Mr. Roberts. Good morning, Your Honor. Um I understood this to be a review hearing, so I'm a little confused at the extent to which certain requests and certain arguments have been I mean, going on. Um, there wasn't even a mental health evaluation requested in the initial restraining order. And it wasn't addressed at the hearing on January 2nd. It wasn't addressed in the GAL update. But now there's a request for something above and beyond anything that's been discussed whatsoever. I think it's inappropriate to, to request this. I think it's outside the scope of what the court has um, the ability to address today. And I don't think there's a, there, there's there's too much response to give here based on that, that, based on that alone. Um, this is obviously a high conflict case. And we've belabored these points previously and I don't I'm happy to go into them but I wasn't planning on going into them because I didn't expect them to be brought up um the issues of sporting events this is there were no there was no proof in the record about these things I understand there's a contract and my clients apologize for the contract he is he has expressed it to mischievous fellows that it was a it was a, it was a significant mistake he's taking steps to come around to um prioritize Liam's plan and his health um, but the nitty gritty and the details that we argued about before, that's mom's word against dad's word, that's something that the court's already addressed. And I think that it is just muddying the waters of why we are here today. The the way I see things from my conversation with Ms. Fellows yesterday, her email, and my understanding of the case is we were on here to revisit two things. My client's contact with Nate, which has been two hours every other week, and the client's contact with Liam, which has been zero. With respect to Nate, my conversation with Ms. Fellows yesterday echoes what she said today that Nate has been having successful, positive, every other week, two hour visits with my client. He wants more. I talked to her and I asked, well, and she mentioned every other weekend is 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 okay with flexibility. And I asked her every other weekend, meaning what they used to have, where it was Friday night to Sunday. Um she wasn't sure about the about the full Friday to Sunday from my recollection. Um, but my question to her, and again my question to you, and I mentioned to Mr. Zandy yesterday as well, um, if he wants to see dad, then perhaps we can have Friday night to Sunday because that's what he wants and there's no pressing imminent issues with him. Um, but allowing flexibility to carve out for sporting events if he has to go to them or a school dance or whatever. Um, my clients indicated to me after me talking to him yesterday that, for example, when there was sporting practice in the morning, the parties don't live 10 minutes from each other. There's a little bit of a commute, although it's not long distance, that um, he'd say, hey, I'm just going to sleep at mom's tonight. Come pick me up in the morning after practice. And that would happen. That kind of flexibility makes sense to me. Um, I'd like to have something in place for what dad does have, but allow carve outs for the 17 year old to be able to say, hey, I got something tomorrow morning. Can we do something afterwards? I don't think that we're going to be coming back. And I think the court can admonish the parties. We can put it in the, we can put it in the plan that deviation because the child has an event or something along those lines or a party or whatever um, is not going to be grounds for contempt for allowing the parenting plan. But allowing some clear time that expands beyond what we currently have is appropriate. Um, and I think Ms. Fellows should chime in on that because this is where we left it yesterday of how we can exactly um, partition that out. Um, but before I go there, I do want to, I do think I have to address the, what Mr. Zandi said about the dad encouraging him to to fight with the stepdad there. That was a highly contested issue and point. There was no corroborating evidence. It was just mom saying that and on the contrary, there was a text from Nate to dad saying, get me out of here. Something along the lines of Russ is being unreasonable or something. Don't quote me on that. But the court seen that text message where the, where the child clearly wanted to leave that environment. Nothing from dad other than saying, you know, hang in there. You can come to me, call me if you need anything. And that was the extent of the actual objective evidence that we had in the record. So anything that that it's it's with what's happened with the medical situation, it's easy to um, try to take a mile from that inch. But that's really not something that that the court made any findings on last last time. And I believe I understand the reasoning behind that. So I think there's no reason to have any limitations on Nate. Um, um, if Nate comes back to mom, that dad did something inappropriate. Well, we can address that as it comes up. But I haven't heard any concerns. Um, from Miss Fellows with respect to Nate outside of the contract issue, which I'm, I'm, I have some nuanced distinctions there, but I'm, I'm not going to belabor the point. Um, moving on to Nate, excuse me, Liam. I did want to touch on the contract briefly. 
there's been this talk of obese. The word obesity was mentioned in the contract, but did not say he was obese. It said he is um, closer to the obese category. Um, I don't, the court might think that's a distinction without a difference, but I, I think terminology is important that it wasn't as extreme as, it, as it's being painted out to be. And I'm looking at the contract right here. I'm not excusing it. My client's apologized for it, but I think it's important to look at the specifics and, and know what we're talking about here and being accurate with it. With respect to Liam, um, and I was talking to Ms. Fellows about what we possibly could do. And we may be at just a point where we're disagreeing here. Um, Liam wants to see his dad. Um, I know that she doesn't have the records, but Liam seems to be doing better. Um, giving him every other weekend isn't something that we're asking for today, but if he wants to see dad, it seems that we can put in some kind of contact that is not, you're going over there for a week and there see you, see you on Tuesday, but something where he has phone calls with dad. He has a two hour visit with dad going to the park. And if he goes home and reports anything inappropriate, we can cancel or revisit or however we, we, we deal with it. But to prevent all contact, I think we just have a disagreement here. And I think having some contact with Liam um, and dad, I'm hoping the court can see that as a net positive understanding that we can have provisions that limit um, what's discussed, that can have safety valves if something does happen, that no visitation until we go back to court. But having some in-person contact, whether it is you know at the park for an hour or um, uh, supervised by Miss Fellows or phone calls that they can have, or at least giving Liam access to his email and phone to contact dad if and when he wants to, um, that seems like that's going to be for the child's in mental health is in his best interest. And I, I would request that we have something along those lines put in place. Um, and then if that's going well, when we have our 30 day review, then we have some track record of contact that is helpful for the child. Um, with respect to our family wizard, my client um, is is happy to do that. Um, he has a call into tech support because he was having some issues with it, but um, that's something that I expect to be up and running. And I don't think there's going to be an issue with that. Um, I would like, and I know we're having a 30 day review, but I'd like to have something, um, some guardrail, some instructions for lack of a better term of what the client needs to do to move things forward. Um, you know, he's, he's, he understands the, the issues with the contract. He's apologized for it. He has consistently been on the plan. Um, there's been some dispute over what exactly what's happening in the, in the context of the, um, medical provider appointments. Um, and I do want to remind the court that, you know, part of this was because there was this cartini option. There were three other options recommended by the nutritionists that Very don't relevant. use feed. Okay. Okay. Your honor, I'm not trying to, to take time, but since these things were brought up, I'm, I feel an obligation to, to provide the context and the bigger picture. Um, so if the court can provide more expansive visitation with Nate, which I really don't think is, is controversial here and, um, some contact with Liam so we can get their contact going, because it seems like that's what the child wants. And there isn't, there aren't any, um, we can keep in, keep this, um, in a safe place, even for the other side's concerns. Um, that would be my request today. Your honor, if I may. It, yeah, keep it short. We've got to keep moving. I, I will. Yes, Your Honor. Um, number one um, is the last sentence in Dr. Rao's four-page letter is perhaps most significant Liam's desire for treatment and own understanding of his illness and what he must do to get healthy are diametrically opposed to his father's. That says it all. And until the father does the groundwork, and gets to a place where he can be accepting, open, willing, following the case plan. There cannot be contact. As a GAL, I can't recommend contact. I want to. However, I don't feel it's in uh, Liam's best interest to have any contact until dad gets to a place where he's open and willing. So I uh, appreciate everything that's been said, and I've allowed more uh, than I, I probably typically would. Uh, just because the court does look at this, it's very serious. Uh, this is a child's life that is at uh, issue here uh, and what is necessary for his best interest in including his medical needs, his mental health needs. Uh, and with that, uh, in regard to Nathan, uh, Nathan, I look at a, a little differently. I, the same issues are still there, but it's not the same 
a fact that uh, I would say in regard to Liam, uh, but there are still concerns. Uh, again, uh, the contract was very real to say, I apologize now, there were very serious matters in that contract that should never have occurred. Uh, so with that, in regard to Nathan, I don't know how to do flexibility, just looking at the parties and seeing flexibility is working, I don't. Uh, that said, Nathan does have his sports, they are important to Nathan. Uh, and so I wanna make sure that that is seen as a priority and of importance for him. Uh, with that, I'm not going to go to every other weekend, but what I am gonna do is from Friday at five until Saturday at noon. Hopefully that doesn't interfere. I don't know when his schedule is for sports. It may have to be worked around, uh, but he needs to get to his sports as a priority. So. Um, that is something that is going to need to happen if uh, that occurs during anybody's time is get him to his sports. That will help him mentally. That will help him uh, in all his activities. So uh, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to change that just a little bit for now. I do. I want to see how it goes and see in 30 days uh, whether dad's been able to avoid uh, the behaviors that uh, have been noted as substantially concerning as it relates to Nathan. In regard to Liam, uh, the court looks at this as a, again, a life and death situation of health and safety for that child. Uh, and uh, because of that, I am gonna maintain dad will not have contact with that child. Uh, the child is doing well. Uh, we want him to continue doing well. And uh, what I'm uh, looking forward to hearing is from Ms. Bellows, as to uh, what the the medical providers have to say as to what might be a good direction to take with addressing matters with dad. Uh, and so I'm not ordering the mental health evaluation at this time. I reserve on that with the idea that uh, Ms. Fellows, when she talks to the doctors, is that something that they foresee as the issue behind this? Or is there something else? And, and look for uh, a recommendation of the, as to those kinds of things uh, when we come back in 30 days. Uh, family wizard will be used. Uh, that is the form of uh, communication between the parties that is to occur. That's not a question. I believe both parties are capable of using it. Uh, and so that will occur. Sole decision making uh, shall still be with mom. Uh, that will continue in all matters. Uh, and so we'll set this over uh, the 30 days. So the next hearing will be March 5, 2024 for another review and input from the guardian litem. In regard to attorney's fees, quite frankly, I didn't look at the financial end of things. I was focused on the kids. So I would just bring that up at that hearing and, and make sure to provide some current financial and I can look at it at that time. And I can present. Oh, your uh, honor is uh, Nathan's the Friday to Saturday. Is that every other weekend? Every other weekend, yes. Okay. Uh, your honor, um, I'd like to make sure that two things. Number one, that dad can attend the sporting events. That was important to Nate as far as I understood it. And um, if there is a sporting event that interferes with dad's time, dad would certainly take him to that. But I'd request that his time be extended so that he can have it with the child versus losing three hours on a Saturday morning. So though I, I've gone back and forth on that particular issue. What I find interesting is Nathan wants him there. And I say that in the sense that if the child was embarrassed by what's being said and what's going on, uh, then I, I wouldn't think that, uh, that would be an issue. My concern is that I believe Liam will probably be present at those hearings and there's a restraining order. So what I want to do is not have him present at this time, but we'll look at it again, bring it back up again on the 5th, uh, because then I can have a better sense of where things are with dad, hopefully, uh, and then we can go from there. So if dad can't be present at the sporting events and they fall on his time, can we not at this extend time, his not for the next 30 days? So even if Saturday morning's take up with sports, dad's time ends at noon? Or can it extend? I, I, my okay. main goal is making sure the child is at their uh, practices and at their games, but no, dad will not be allowed to say. I'm not gonna have 
risks of contact. Right, right. I, I just, I mean, with the makeup time, if he's losing a, you know, Friday night and Saturday morning, if I he get can get that. the time. We're only talking okay. about 30 days, sir. You want to set a presentation date? Uh, we can set a presentation date. Uh, a, can you get it done in a week? Trying the best, yeah. We'll make it two weeks. Double, double check with my <laughs> JA. I can't remember if that's the date that I'm out. I may be out. I'm thinking that Mr. Roberts can probably come in and reorder. Okay. Uh, but all right. Have the day just traffic. Karen, I'm having some difficulty with my internet. Is it All acceptable right. if I keep my video off? That's fine. Go ahead, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Megan Gilmore for the petitioner moving party, namely Skylar Towns. This matter is before the court and my client's motion for contempt. A final parenting plan was entered on in February of 2021 based on the agreement of the parties. Both parties were represented by counsel at that time. Within this order, the parties have joint decision making on education, non-emergency health care, and extracurricular activities. My client is to have no less than three hours of daytime visitation each week to coincide with his work schedule. Looking to the contempt, respondent moved in violation of the relocation statute as well as the parenting plan. As detailed within my client's declaration, my client asked respondent on several occasions within text message if she moved as he was concerned based on the child's statements. In response, respondent specifically stated that she had no intention of moving and knew her obligation to provide notice to my client under the relo relocation statute. When the child continued to disclose that he was living with his grandmother, my client again followed up with mother at the next month. Respondent then informed my client that she had already moved and provided an address, which is confirmed to be within the Tootle School District, which is in a different school district than the child was currently at. Respondent has not only moved, but we have substantial evidence to suggest that she was living away from the child for a significant period of time in violation of Section 14. Uh, my client does not agree that the child should move schools, and we believe that respondent is attempting to force his hand in violation of the court's order. We do ask the court to find contempt as she clearly moved um, with no notice to my client in violation, again, of the relocation statute as well as the parenting plan. We ask the court order that the child remain in its current school district absent an actual agreement of the parties. Similar to the violation of the relocation statute, respondent has repeatedly um, re violated the decision-making provisions of the parenting plan. First, looking to extracurricular activities, this is not a one-time incident. The evidence shows the respondent is engaging the child in activities without informing my client or involving my client in decision-making at least three times a year for the, over the last three years. She's not only signing up the child for activities without discussing it with my client, she's also not naming my client a point of person of contact and is providing my client not providing my client the schedule. There's been several occasions where my client has missed practices and games prior to being even finding out the child is engaged in said activity. Respondent does this over and over and then puts it on the burden on my client to pull the child out of the activity. That then makes my client not only look like a bad parent for failing to show up for the game and the activities, but then is going to then be responsible for disengaging the child in the activity based on mother's violations. Beyond extracurricular activities, as referenced within the messages, respondent is constantly giving my client the runaround on the child's providers and his appointments. The evidence shows that she violated the joint decision making provision regarding uninsured, excuse me, a non emergency emergency health care when um, she had the child evaluated for mental health without involving my client. Um, she took my client off as an authorized user with the child's primary care physician and has consistently failed to exchange information about the child's providers. Just recently, the dental um, was an issue. Respondent further violates the parenting plan by abusing conflict and involving the child. My client explains in his declaration that respondent has repeatedly made no negative comments or fights at exchanges in front of the child. After initiating a fight, she'll make statements to the child and, and to my client, are you, are you indicating that the child is being a liar? And this is all done in front of the child. She'll then even go off as far as asking this extremely young child if she, um, he wants her to address any more issues with his father in front of at exchanges. She makes statements that suggest to the child that his father's home is not his real home and he shouldn't be comfortable there. She consistently at exchanges reassures the child that she only has to have two overnight. He only has to be um, at my client's home for two overnights. Respondent also picks and chooses when she wants to give my client daytime visitation um, that is court ordered each week. Her excuses range from the child being with mother um, with her mother to wanting to celebrate her birthday for three days. Even after being served with this motion some time ago, she violated this provision and denied my client daytime visitation as indicated within our reply. My client has limited funds and unfortunately was um, pushed to a breaking point, particularly relating to the relocation and was forced to file this motion. As detailed within the text messages, my client has attempted to resolve this issue without bringing a motion on numerous occasion and has threatened and advised um, mother that if she continues to violate the parenting plan, he'd be forced to bring this motion 
investigation, which we unfortunately had to do today. My client took on even more fees caused by respondents' delay. As detailed within our email correspondence um, prior to the last hearing, um, respondent was served with this underlying motion in order to show cause in November. Respondent retained counsel in January. My client voluntarily set the matter over two weeks to provide um, sufficient time to respond. She then still failed to timely respond, and the case was set over yet again. We asked the court find respondent in contempt for her repeat violations of Section 5, Section 8, Section 13, and Section 14 of the parent parenting plan. My client is very detailed in his declaration, and um, I would defer to the court on that if the court has any questions. Um, in addition to the contempt finding, we are asked the court, um, awarding, asked the court award attorney's fees in the amount of $2,000. Again, this is numerous violations that took substantial attorney's fees to detail to the court. Um, and again, it's, it's relatively egregious. So we do ask the court find contempt on the multiple violations of the parenting plan and award substantial fees in this case. Ms. Dow? Um, Your Honor, as far as the relocation issue and where the child lives is concerned, um, since everyone moved back to Washington from Montana, um, the child and Ms. Medina have always lived with her mother or very briefly in her mother's home um, after her mother moved out of it. Uh, that was not owned by her mother. It was leased home. Um, her mother has always helped her with finances and emergencies because she is very low income. Um, when Ms. Medina tried to take over her mother's lease in the previous home, um, it became clear that she would not be able to manage it without help. And it was a, I believe it was a family decision that she wouldn't stay there if she could get the landlord to let her out of the lease. Um, once she had that confirmed, um, they were expecting to move into a new home on the property where her mother lives, um, new to them. It wasn't a new house. Um, she provided Mr. Towns with the address. As to the child saying that he was going to grandmother's home or um, when uh, the child was at grandmother's home, the, the child making these statements, the child has always lived in grandmother's home, as has the mother. Um, it was normal for her to be staying with her mother while she was waiting to have this other home renovated. Um, as it turns out, they were unable to move into the other house, but they're still in, their, in her mother's home. Um, Ms. Medina was always under the impression that that home, uh, which is the same street address, uh, was always in the Castle Rock School District. Um, since Mr. Towns did not agree to change the schools, she had no occasion to check that assumption, um, especially since Tootle is one of those rural school, school districts that freely draws from the surrounding school districts. If you look at the exhibits and the exchange of communications between the two parties, she was not pressuring Mr. Towns to move the child to Tootle. Um, she dropped the subject when he said he didn't agree. The child's still at Castle Rock. Um, she... Uh, uh, Mr. Towns has been relying on communication issues between the two of them from 2021 and 2022. Um, as my client freely admits, their communications were not good in those days while they were working things out. These people were very young. They had a young child. Um, they've been in communications about sports, other issues. Those communications have improved significantly over the past year. Uh, I'd say all but one or two of the incidents that Mr. Towns has been complaining about took place well over a year ago, more like a year and a half ago. Um, since her declaration was filed, uh, my client has contacted Dr. Hendrickson's office and they tell her that mm, they're very familiar with Mr. Towns and he's been in their records uh, since they moved back to Washington. Dr. Hendrickson has always been the child's doctor. Um, she doesn't know what happened with this communication when he tried to contact the doctor. Uh, they did not apparently did not give her a very satisfactory answer about it. Um, she has confirmed, however, that he is in their records. Um, she did not have the child evaluated for anything, um, as Mr. Towns is stating, because uh, Dr. Hendrickson had never heard back from Mr. Towns, so she didn't go forward with it. Um, as far as communications about sports go, I believe my client covered that in her declaration, and both parties' exhibits show the nature of their communications. She said she stuck to activities that they had previously, sorry, previously discussed in a general way, the way parents would do about the kinds of sports that they want their children, um, or in this case, their own child to participate in. Um, she's provided him with contact information and with the schedules, and she's provided that information to him directly when he demanded that she do it herself rather than go to the parent's website. 
the more recent communications in 2023 show that their communications about sports have been appropriate. Um, finally, the issue about midweek visits. Your Honor, that's fundamentally a problem with the language of the parenting plan. There's no set schedule for those. There's no requirement for specific advance arrangements. Uh, my client has done her best to accommodate what are often last minute requests. Um, the few times that she has not accommodated that, she's already had plans. Um, and Mr. Towns, I mean, Mr. Towns has submitted an exhibit showing that, you know, I have time off right now, I want it now. Um, the most recent issue that Mr. Towns provided uh, in his reply declaration from this year uh, recently sh clearly shows that Ms. Medina was out of town when the request was made. Um, her, her responsive text message says they just got back. Um, I think that uh, what we're looking at here, Your Honor, is a young couple who were doing their best to figure this out while not liking each other very much for the first couple of years of their parenting plan. They've managed to work most of that out, um, except this thing, apparently, about Mr. Medina uh, making requests, short notice, my client has had to align her schedule and the child's schedule with Mr. Medina's. Um, she's had to be very flexible and she has been very flexible. Um, she's done her best to cope with that. I'm asking the court to recognize what the situation is um, and that to recognize that my client over the last year in 2023 has greatly improved her communications with Mr. Towns. He's improved his communications with her. The tone of their communications, if you look at those text exhibits from 2023, were much more like parents who are talking with each other about their child and appropriately co-parenting. Um, and I'm asking the court to find that my client has not acted in bad faith um, and that she's not in contempt of the parenting plan. I don't know if it would be appropriate at this point, Your Honor, but um, we would also like to ask that the court indicate to both parents that it would be in everybody's interest if they set up some sort of a written agreement that says how they're going to handle those midweek uh, visitation. Yeah, I'm not going to get into that. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Counsel? Yeah. Just very briefly, Your Honor. I think I, I am concerned that mother at this point is borderline, borderline on being dishonest to the court. She, the materials show that she was living at even um, counsel's notice of a draw acknowledges that at the time that our final parenting plan was entered. She would continue to re reside at one, which is in the Castle Rock School District. She then provides a text message after moving that she then moved to her mother's residence at one um, Toodle School District. There was a very clear violation of the parenting plan. She was not living with her mother. Similarly, mother pleads ignorance regarding the violation of the non-emergency health care. However, again, the records clearly show for themselves that she removed my client from the primary care my, and then my client then remedies it. All of these issues are that my client, she violates the parenting plan. My client ha then has to harass her to remedy the issue. And then she finally does so after months and months of back and forth. Similarly with the extracurricular activities, I think that the records speak for themselves. Um, he's being informed substantially after the fact of the extracurricular activities. There's no historical status quo. This is a very young child. Um, and again, my client isn't provided notice, isn't given the opportunity to decision making, and frankly, she um, acknowledges that within her reply materials. Regarding daytime visitation, my client is giving her substantial notice up to 24 to 48 hours. That's not even required in the parenting plan, and there's no evidence saying that she is unavailable. She frankly is unwilling. Lastly, this wasn't addressed in my original materials, but we do have ongoing concerns regarding the medical insurance, and she doesn't provide us any insurities within her um, responsive materials that she has addressed this issue. This is a major issue that need, the child needs to be covered on a medical medical insurance and that needs to be ordered by the court thank you well i did review the files and record uh and it based on the files uh and and record as i indicated court does find the respondent mother uh in contempt uh it's very clear especially with the the moves uh the addresses uh and so in particular she was willfully and intentionally moved to a location that is in another school zone and then tried to have the father agree to change the school. That's not acceptable. Uh, there needs to be communication. There is a process to follow uh, in the uh, orders of the court. Also, the court does believe the mother has failed to involve the father in the, all the joint decision. Uh, that again, part of an order needs to be followed. Uh, it's not a pick and choose kind of thing uh, to, as to when uh, she will consult with the father and the information regarding the child and communicating with the child. 
so this is, as I say, a court order that needs to be followed. It does sound like a difficult schedule, and I think that may need to be something, Ms. Dow, that needs to get brought up in regard to that midweek. Uh, but it is what is ordered, and it's required by the order to follow what is contained therein. Uh, as to attorney's fees, the court does find it's only appropriate that they be ordered. Uh, the court is ordering $1,500. The court recognizes the respondent mother may not have the immediate resources, so a payment plan of $100 per month shall be paid toward the fees until paid in full, uh, and that's commencing as of March 1, and the court uh, is not ordering any other additional penalties at this time. I believe the order should be relatively straightforward, but for tracking purposes, can we set it on for presentation? Yeah, February 27th. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Do we have Brianna uh, Early Wine? Your Honor, I didn't anticipate her being present today. We were just able to effectuate service on Sunday. Uh, so it was going to be my request to set this matter over. I did file that proof of service yesterday and I did provide you a bench copy. Um, I don't know if you have that in front of you, uh, but there was some. Um, dramatics to say the least our process server was uh, shot at the last time he attempted service so uh, at this point I am asking for the immediate restraining order to be continued um, if you want to set this matter over two weeks is probably best maybe three because we're probably going to have to have the uh, sheriff's office serve her given the incident this past weekend we can set it to the 27th if you like okay um, I can prepare an order extending and then I will just send that over for your honor signature ex parte yeah that's fine and just okay. put not appear for her okay I can do that thank you judge you. So I did not see any objections that were filed uh, and I don't have a proposed order. So your honor, we have agreement on everything with the exception of section five, because that actually wasn't ruled upon at the last hearing. I think we all just missed it. Um, if we can get that addressed today, then we should have everything ready to have you sign because we have no other issues. Okay. Tell me in particular, because I don't know what five is. Decision making, excuse me. Okay. And I can make an argument for that, but if the court recalls everything, um, however you want to use your time. Let me just get back in here and then usually I say it. So go ahead and uh, tell me, I think I had the idea that it, I, I'm just looking at some notes uh, that there was an already ordered visit schedule. There was a visitation schedule. It's supervised um, and limited. Um, father also has a 3A factor. So I don't know if the court even has the ability to not have sole decision making with mom. That's all, that's her request. Um, but we didn't get that clear from you. So we wanted to get that clarity. Ms. Holder? The 3A factor has to do with um, a sexual conviction from 20 years ago when Mr. Pittman was 18 years old. As far as the decision making goes right now, the child is one years old, has spent time in the home with both parents. Both parents have been caregivers to the child. And if you remember last time, Judge, the reason we um, had to do the visitation schedule the way we did originally, it was supervised by um, parties, not um that mother didn't agree with, and then it's been moved to supervised visitations through a counseling center. Um, I think that joint decision making, it should say joint decision making as these are temporary orders, nothing has been decided yet. And there's nothing to indicate that mother has been the sole decision maker for the child so far in the child's life. And dad has been involved. Um, as far as the the limitation on him, it had to do with an incident that happened 20 years ago and a conviction when he was a teenager, and it doesn't have to do with anything involving this child or any of his children. Robert? The, the, the engagement is highly disputed. My client's position is, hit, and she put in her declarations and spoke with the GAL that his position was basically, I come home from work and the woman does everything else. They do not get along well right now. They have no contact with each other. They've been ordered to our family wizard, which at which um is their limited contact only about the child. So I know the three A. I'm not the three A factor was I believe it was a statutory rate. Um, I'm not blowing it into something it's not. However, I think that I, I am. I know there might be a legal prohibition from doing anything other than decision making with mom. That said, even three B factors, mom doesn't want to engage with him. 
the 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 parties not wanting to or at least one party not wanting to have contact with the other exists so there's two grounds which i believe that it sh should be solely with mom he has supervised visitation miss holder is correct that a one-year-old probably there isn't going to be much to decide but this is a situation where my client doesn't want to decide anything with him and i think she has good reason to do so especially when there's supervised visitation it's sort of a weight on the scale towards in, uh, an, as an asymmetry and a variety of factors and it will be her request. So I understand the uh, limitation may be back in time. Uh, at the same time, I'm looking at that there is supervised visits. Uh, the child is one, correct? That's the age? Um, yeah, one. And It'll be two in July. Okay. I was thinking it was coming up. Okay. Um, that in regard to that, uh, I am going to order that mom has sole decision making at this time. That's something that the guardian litem uh, can look at, and we can revisit it. But for now, that's what I'm going to do. On on five B, the reason for decision making, it says. I mean, th th it says, are we clicking the three A box? Because I didn't see an option for none. There's no reason to limit decision making. So and I'm, so, therefore, I think that three A automatically pre prevents it. Um, but for the justification for it, are we putting limitations in 3A? Are we also putting 3B because one party does not want to and it's reasonable because of the history between the parties? Or how would you like that? I, I think the history of each party's or each parent's participation in decision making would be appropriate as well. As in addition to 3A? Yes. Okay. Okay, we should be able to, unless Ms. Holder has any questions, I think we can get a signed order to you um, ASAP. Not that it's splitting hairs, Your Honor, but based on Mr. Um, Mr. Roberts' arguments, I think, as opposed to the parents' uh, history of participation and decision-making, I think it would be more appropriate that the parents' ability and desire to cooperate with each, with each other would be more appropriate in this situation. I would agree to that. I apologize. That's fine. That's fine. Either one is fine as far as what I, I've heard. So that, that third one's fine. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. We should have that to you um, very shortly. All right. I don't think we need Thank a control date. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Thank you both. All right, counsel, go ahead. And for the record, I, I have reviewed everything. So um, go ahead. All right. Uh, and I'll keep it brief, Your Honor, with that understanding. I'm Kurt Anagnasu, and I represent Roberta Edmondson. Uh, and this is her motion for uh, temporary orders. Um, just briefly, I'd like to point out to the court that in Mr. Edmondson's petition uh, at paragraph 10, he indicated uh, that there was a need for spousal support uh, and that he had the ability to pay. Um, but um, this matter, uh, up to date, he hasn't uh, paid anything to my client. Um, and so, uh, you know, we can go through the, the, the declarations, but the, the bottom line is my client moved out here. Uh, sold all her assets in Kansas, uh, and um, uh, the, the marriage um, fell apart. And uh, uh, she took a plane and just her personal property, uh, you know, she he claimed that she took knives, that kind of stuff. You can't take that on a plane. And she, and she didn't. She took a suitcase of clothes and things, and she went back to, to the Kansas area, uh, and she's living with a friend. Um, and so uh, what we're asking for, uh, just to get to the point, Your Honor, is that we need a temporary spousal support. He supplied his income. He has a six thousand dollars of net income, um, and uh, my client has thirteen hundred of gross income. Uh, hers is Social Security, so uh, maybe she doesn't pay much taxes on that. But in any event, um, uh, we're asking for a, a spousal support, temporary spousal support of fifteen hundred dollars a month. We think that's reasonable and appropriate, given the finances and uh, incomes of the parties. My client doesn't have any income, and and Mr. Edmondson works. Uh, and then um, she needs to get her personal property um, and she needs a vehicle. Uh, and um, he, even in his response, he indicated that uh, she was offered very various vehicles, um, uh, the uh, Mini Coopers and that kind of stuff, but she needs a truck. Um, and she identified the, the, the truck that she's requesting for on a temporary basis. Uh, what she would like to do, she has a friend that will help her. And, and of course, his family uh, has been accommodating, uh, but she would like to fly out here, she, you know, and that's going to be an expense to her. But um, she indicated she could do that, uh, pay for her and her friend to fly out here. Um, she wants to pick up the truck um, and then they need a U-Haul to haul all of her uh, personal property back to Kansas 
Um, I mean, she was from that area and, and moved here, uh, you know, for Mr. Edmondson as, as part of uh, being married. Um, and she needs to get her stuff home. So that's that's her uh, request uh, of the court that Mr. Edmondson, when she gets out here with her friend, rents a, a U-Haul truck. Uh, and, you know, if, if he wants to help or not, or the family or uh, her and her friend will load up the truck and drive her personal property uh, back to Kansas. Um, and then, uh, and so we're asking for, for that to occur uh, and for her to be able to, to, to keep the truck on a temporary basis. These are only temporary orders. And then we're asking for an award of attorney's fees um, she needs, uh, attorney's fees for me to continue to represent her. She came in, uh, with a, a $2,500 retainer. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to spend most of that to get through these temporary orders and she's out of state. And I think she needs, a you know, attorney here in Washington to, to represent her. Um, but, uh, she doesn't have any funds available to continue to, to pay me. So we're asking for and a temporary award of attorney's fees of, of $5,000 for me to uh, continue to represent her in, in this case, uh, depending on if it goes to a settlement conference or if we if we uh, settle it short of that, uh, you know, uh, we can work out the terms later. But um, that would be held in, in trust so, so that I can continue to represent Ms. Edmondson uh, while she lives out of state. So those are our requests, John. Ms. Bliss? Thank you, Your Honor. For the record, Carly Bliss on behalf of the petitioner and moving party, namely Stephen Edmison. Uh, Your Honor's re reviewed the pleading, so I won't uh, belabor my client's declaration. I'll just hit a couple high points. Uh, first and foremost, this is a six-year marriage. Uh, by wife's own declaration, she worked uh, nearly four of those six years and then decided, I'm going to retire. Uh, so I asked the court to take that into consideration when, con when considering whether or not to award uh, maintenance. Uh, secondarily, looking at uh, my client's budget in, in conjunction with his income, uh, if he acknowledges for the court that he does earn a combined income of about $6,400 net per month. Uh, he provides his budget to the court that his monthly expenses are nearly $5,000. Uh, so for wife to request a monthly uh, spousal support payment of $1,500, that puts him in the red every single month. He provides for the court that he has roughly $1,468 of expendable income after all of his expenses are, are met. Um, he provides for the court that he attempted to resolve this matter amicably, that this motion came as a surprise to him uh, with initial with the initial filing. He sent uh, a proposal to Ms. Edmison, which included spousal maintenance, which included providing her uh, a vehicle, which included providing her all of her assets. Uh, and what does she do? She turns around and files this motion, which most of the matters are largely agreed upon. Uh, so to make an additional request for attorney's fees when this motion was unnecessary, uh, I think is inappropriate. Uh, and is simply a way of, of Ms. Edmison using the system to um, cause unnecessary expenses uh, and to harass my client. My client provides for the court that upon separation, he offered to fix the truck and allow her to take it. She said, no, she wanted the Mini Cooper. He said, fine, take the Mini Cooper. She took neither. She took a plane and left. Uh, he offered to package all of her belongings that she left at the home and ship them to her. She refused to provide him an address, refused to speak with him. He couldn't do so. So now we're before the court with the motion, which my client has already attempted to resolve all of these issues. Uh, and with that, requesting an exorbitant amount of attorney's fees, which isn't feasible, A, given the uh, length of the marriage, it's only a short-term marriage. Uh, B, wife doesn't have a need. She provides for the budget that she, or she provides in her declaration, excuse me, that she lives with her uh, former mother-in-law rent-free, doesn't have any expenses. The only need that she provides to the court is a need for a vehicle, which my client is still willing to provide. I would just note for the court that both parties acknowledge that the truck that is being requested at this point uh, was my client's separate property coming into the marriage. I understand counsel's argument that these are just temporary orders, but if you consider the fact that Mrs. is now living in Kansas, while it may be temporary, getting a vehicle out to Kansas and then saying, no, it's going to be returned to my client at the end of the divorce, I think is counterproductive. Uh, so I would ask the court to allow my client to maintain his separate property, which is the truck, uh, allow Mrs. to have a, a Mini Cooper or one of the various vehicles that the parties acquired during the marriage. Um, <clears throat> again, discussing the personal property. My client has already offered to box up all of her property. If she's planning on coming to Washington to transport it back to herself, he has no objection to that. Uh, there are some some minor uh, personal property items that he had uh, during the relationship that are now disappeared. He believes they either may be with a friend or uh, someone here in Washington. Obviously, he acknowledges you can't bring butcher knives on an airplane. Uh, however, they are no longer in his in his home. Uh, so he is asking um, the butcher knives for one, uh, the the keys to her, his Corvette uh, and Mini Cooper. She doesn't uh, provide any clarification for that in her responsive pleadings, uh, but he believes that those are in her possession as well. He's just simply asking that those be returned.
Uh, so to summarize, uh, we're asking the court to um, order a nominal amount of spousal support. He does acknowledge that she does need some support for a transition a transition period, uh, but 1500 is an ex exorbitant amount and he simply does not have the funds to pay for that. Uh, we are asking for the court uh, to order that Mrs. return the personal property items uh, that are either in her direct possession or in the possession of, of friends or family members in Washington um, and to uh, deny the request for attorney's fees. Again, this motion was unnecessary. The parties were attempting to resolve this matter amicably, uh, but for Ms. Edmison uh, bringing this matter before the court, uh, fees wouldn't have been spent. Mr. Agnostu, anything further? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, just briefly, uh, my client uh, cannot continue to live where she's living. A, 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 uh, she's only there temporarily uh, while we get this matter resolved. She needs to to put get into her own residence, and that's why we asked for the temporary support. We put together a budget based on her uh, getting a, an apartment and living on her own. It's very rural where she's at, and it's my understanding uh, that Mr. Edmondson offered uh, to send her property via a pod, but pods don't get delivered where she lives out in, in rural part of, uh, of Kansas. So, uh, you know, she's been, uh, you know, kind of months and months without her, uh, personal property. So, that, uh, that's why we're asking that, uh, that, um, she be allowed to come out and pick up her stuff, uh, and take a truck back home. She needs, she needs a truck. It's a temporary order. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, in the interim, we provided a, a picture to your honor that, uh, you know, Mr. Edmondson recently bought another new truck. I mean, he has a truck. Um, so these are just temporary orders. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mr. Edmondson uh, and, and my client were unable to work out the, the terms of these because, uh, he, you know, he went it his way. He wants her to have a Mini Cooper and that's it. Uh, and, uh, you know, in rural Kansas, that's just not going to uh, fly. She wants a truck. And so uh, he's indicated at least at the beginning of this, that, yeah, you could have the truck, um, but now here we are arguing about it. So um, uh, we're seeking the court's orders uh, to move this uh, matter along, uh, and she does need um, uh, an award of attorney's fees for me to, to be able to continue for her to have representation here in Washington while she's in Kansas. All right, I reviewed the files and record uh, based on that first issue in regard to maintenance. I am going to order some maintenance. Uh, it's going to be $1,200 per month. Uh, that there is no question that at this time there is a need by the wife to receive funds. Uh, there's a question about the ability to pay. Uh, bottom line is there's simply not enough money to go around, but the husband is clearly in the better financial position. So the court is going to order uh, the $1,200 per month. That's going to be for six months. It's going to be for a limited time. Uh, and this will allow the wife to get some employment where she resides if she acquires full-time employment or employment that equals greater than this amount, the maintenance shall terminate. If it's less than this amount, uh, then the difference uh, between the gross and uh, the 1200 will be paid to her again, just for that six months. In regard to the vehicle, if it's separate property, my concern is because she's back in Kansas, to come here and drive it back. Uh, there may be reasons why to give it, but. Uh, if it's a separate property he had prior to the time of marriage, then I'm not going to order that. So if she wants to have the Mini Cooper, uh, then she can have the Mini Cooper. She can fly out, get it, and drive it back. But I'm not going to order him to ship it to her. Uh, in regard to the personal property, same thing. Uh, other than it's really difficult to say, yes, she can have her personal property. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that list contains. Uh, so the... Uh, parties shall exchange a list to see if they can reach an agreement as what is the wife's personal property. If the parties cannot agree, then you can bring it back and the court can spend time. But chances are the value of the things that they're going to argue about aren't worth the time of uh, bringing it back. So, uh, so again, as to the idea of him shipping it to where she's at, the, the court's not going to do that. Um, definitely not without some pricing to consider. Uh, the request to, uh, for protecting property, that's granted. Each responsible for future debts, that's granted. Insurance, uh, granted that neither party is to change the insurance of any kind at this time. Uh, so that's to be done. In regard to attorney's fees, again, similar. Uh, the husband is the one with the income and the assets. Uh, and so the court is going to order attorney's fees of $3,000 to be paid within 90 days to Mr. Antonostu's office. Uh, and that should take care of it for now. We want to set a presentation date for 27th? Uh, 
if you can get it done in a week, then we can set it on for next Tuesday. Otherwise, the 27th. Let's go to the 27th. Hopefully, you can reach an agreement. Uh, yeah, I think I have drafted an order. I'll make the changes per your ruling, and hopefully, we can agree. So, uh, we should be able to do it next week. That's right. Okay. I'll oh, put wait, on um, the 13th. What, what is next week? Is that the, is that the, I'm out next Tuesday. Let's just do the 27th in hopes that we can just get an agreement otherwise. We'll put it on the 27th then. Thank you. Thank you. So for the record, I'm Chelsea Baldwin. I represent Amy Yanez. This is our motion for contempt along with our motion to modify temporaries. We also have the guardian ad litem with us and that's Ms. Turnbull services in your file effective um, on the 12th of last month, it's been nearly a month. There are pressing issues um, that directly impact the health and safety of the young people in this case. Um, I'm essentially going to address some of the financial issues. Hold on, Ms. Baldwin, I'm sorry. Just a minute. I'm looking for my notes. So, and go ahead. Your Honor, if I could address, address the uh, financial issues, talk about some of the parenting issues, and then circle back around to the financial issues to wrap it up. We do have two motions, and I was just planning essentially to address um, address them all at, all together unless you want to address one motion at a time. Okay, so uh, Mr. Yanis has something to say. Let me hear from him real quick. Go ahead, sir. So I currently don't have legal representation. I'm asking for a continuance so I can uh, get the time to acquire new representation. Okay, how much time are you talking about? Um, I currently have a uh, appointment set up with Chad Zandy's office uh, March 4th. And then um, I have two other client or two other attorneys that I'm trying to meet with as well that are scheduled out in two weeks. So I'm I'm asking at least three, maybe four weeks. Ms. Baldwin. So my issue here is that we have a young person that's engaging in self-harm during the father's time. Um, and the uh, belief now is that the father's also medicating the child on his time and not telling my client. So those are substantial issues that simply cannot, we can't just kick the can down the road while that child is self-harming in the father's care. Um, that is the chief concern. I don't have any significant issues uh, with pushing financial issues or even the contempt down the road. I do have a health and safety concern for the child in pushing the children's issues on the parenting plan. I don't recall exactly, Ms. Baldwin, if I continued this for two weeks, um, how many visits would dad have between now and then? He would still have, and it depends on where they are in their rotation. So this is essentially a 60-40 plan. One week he has like a single day, but the opposite week he has five days. So it depends on where we are in that. If the court wants to enter an interim order that just says we're not going to do visits um, between now and that would be the 20th, that would be acceptable, um, or that there would be minimal visits um, between now and the 20th. I think that's a way of mitigating um, those issues of um, the health and safety issues. Um, but that's the really the chief concern. Your Honor, the weekend of the 16th and 17th, that's the next full um, five days that I have with them. So is that the only time that you have? And then, well, every Wednesday. Uh, so, so Wednesday... So Tomorrow yeah. we'll have them, and then on the 14th I will have them through the 18th or through the 19th. Right. So it's not it's not just the weekend. It's Wednesday through Monday morning um, on one week, and then a Wednesday to Thursday overnight on the following week. So it's it's a five day stretch. And again, where we have a child self harming, that's the problem. Yeah. So. I did review the file. Uh, I understand you're not represented and I can appreciate you want to have an attorney at the same time. I'm concerned about the safety of the child has been indicated. Uh, okay. I'm not saying it, it's, it's true or not true, but I have concerns just based on what I've read. So- Has uh, this been presented to the court, Your Honor? Because I, I have not heard of the self-harm or this accusation. It was in the documents that I read. So, uh, uh, if you want to meet with it or set this over a couple of weeks uh, and reduce down your time, I'd be willing to uh, set it over the two weeks. And reduce my time? Yes. With all my children? Is it just the one child you're concerned with, Ms. Baldwin? Or No, because the other child are being involved um, essentially in the deceit. So the one child self-harming, there's three total children. Um, they are 16, 15, and 12. It's the 12-year-old that's self-harming. 
the 15 and 16 year old are being directly involved um, in the deceit. And then we now have a case over in juvenile court, which there was no reply. So I wasn't able to put this in because there's nothing to respond to. But we now have a child that's um, becoming delinquent um, and uh, on the uh, truancy docket uh, or was uh, starting to be a part of that docket. So there, there are substantial concerns. And Your Honor, the, the juvenile case is actually- yeah, I, I don't want to get into it. The only, uh, so My point I, is I'm not really concerned about stuff. the juvenile. It's the other part that I'm mainly concerned about. Yeah, I, I'm unaware of, of her self-harming. She is, she is medicated while she is with me. That is under her doctor's orders <laughs> and a prescription that's been prescribed from the doctor. Yeah. And, and medicated while she's with him. That, that's the, again, that's the, such but a key concern. Uh, I can't hear both of you is that he didn't notify my client. So she's only receiving medication while she's with him. Your doctor, or your honor, the doctor uh, was actually, your, my wife was with the doctor during the physical when the medication was prescribed. I was okay. not notified of the medication. I actually okay. had to read so it. I, I'm going to stop hours. this here. If you want to set it over two weeks, I'm going to reduce the time because based on what I've read, I have concerns. I'm not saying they're real or not. Uh, I'm just saying at this point, I have the concerns that I feel like at least something, if we're gonna set it over two weeks before I, uh, you can get an attorney on board, that's my concern. So I, I wouldn't necessarily reduce it a whole lot, uh, just to a, a, the weekend time. And so you have the 7th through the 11th and then the 14th, is that right? No, Your Honor, I have them every Wednesday and the next full stamp will be the 14th through the uh, 19th. So he would have this Wednesday to, so he'd have the 7th to the 8th would be his regular time. And then the 14th through the, uh, and it, because of the holiday, I think it'd be the 14th through the 20th would be his regular time. 14th through the 19th. 19th. It, it would be the 20th. So what I, you could have the 14th. Just the, the evenings of the 7th, the 14th, and then the weekend, uh, 16 through 18. Okay. And the... Eliminating the Friday, the 15th? Friday's the 16th. 16th, sorry. So it'd be sat Friday to Sunday. Okay. And the court's intention is for the 7th and the 14th to just be day visits. Right. Evening visits. Right. Uh, let's do overnight. after school to uh, after school till seven. I, I they're older, it can be eight. Okay. Um, and then Friday after school till Sunday and use that same eight PM. Correct. Your Honor, okay. could um could we move the Wednesdays to nine? The kids are usually at youth group. I'll, I'll make it I want it at eight. Get them home. Great. Um well, just do you want to do that or what do you want to do? What up to you. You want, you, if you want to think about it, you can. Hi. Sorry. So if, if I didn't want to do this, then what? We would go forward today. But like I said, I have enough concern based on my reading of things that uh, I would limit things at this point. I'm, I'm not prepared. I have an attorney, so. Okay. All right. You're still seeing them. It's just for less time. Okay. Your Honor, there's significant issues of concern when they're with their mother's care. The CPS is involved. Okay. There's a, a protection I, I order against her. I don't have any of that in front of me, sir. If you want to do this. I don't have this accusation of, of self-harm and medication in front of me. Sir, which do you want to do? Do you want to argue it today or do you want to continue it? I'll take the modification of the time. I, I need more time to find attorneys. Okay. So do you want to go with the two weeks? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Your Honor, do you want to do a bench order or do you want me to just, uh, I can do a quick interim order. Um, it's your it's your call. <laughs> you want to do a quick order and get it over to me and then get it to Mr. Yanis. Uh, let me make sure I have his email address. Your Honor, how do I get a copy of, of what's mm -hmm. accused? Okay. So, so long as it looks like it's right, Yanez. No. Okay. What's your email? Yanez. Email. Okay. 
Uh, I will send that um, to him today to review and sign. I would just ask that he review and sign. Um, it's so, pretty straightforward. Have you not received, been served with the documents? Not, not she, the only ones I've been served with are contempt and a modification of parenting plan. There was nothing in there about uh, self-harm or medication. He's saying he hasn't received anything that has about the self-harm and the medication, which I read that's been filed. So can you send him another, another copy of everything? I can. He was personally served. Um, and then he also had an attorney um, when we served him. So I sent her a copy as well. So he's actually gotten it twice, but I will send him an additional copy. Okay. Just let's make, make it sure that there's no question. So when we're here next time. Okay. So give me an order, Ms. Baldwin, uh, and email him the documents. I read it as RB2 in the file. So I think that may be part of what's going on. RB2? Sorry. So it's RJ in oh. your email. We'll set this over two weeks to uh, February 20 at nine o'clock. Your Honor, um, the domestic violence protection order hearing is at the same time against Amy. So to move okay. that to a different time. We'll address that with that court. Yeah. Okay. Are you the attorney on that matter, Ms. Baldwin? I am, a, I am not at this time. I'm aware of that case. It has not been properly served um, on my client. So instead of responding to this case, he filed a DVPO and then it hasn't been served on my client. Okay. So what you need to do is on that day is go ahead and let that judge know that you also have a hearing here. Okay. Uh, hopefully you'll have an attorney and it can be handled through the attorney. Okay. And that way you have your time in each court. Okay. The, the difficulty is, I mean, the, the soonest I have is is with uh, Chad Dandy's office March 4th. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to get an attorney by the 20th. I'm giving you two weeks to take care of it. I don't know what else to tell you at this time. I'm not going to set it out to the March based on what I've read. So um, it's up to you what you do in the next two weeks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I take it you're Ms. Australia. Yes, okay. yes, Your Honor. Okay. Can I have you pull that mic just right down in front of you? So Is that sure. close enough? There we go. Okay. Your Honor, I'm Brett Bender. I represent Lucas Osbrander, a respondent, and it's my client's motion. Okay. And you filed your notice of appearance? I did. I filed this morning at 8 30. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank Good. You. And we have come to an agreement. So I'm just going to quickly read it into the record, provided Ms. Okay. Osbrander can object. Uh, regarding the personal property return, the uh, parties agree that my client will get the TV. The Samsung TV, uh, to the extent it's available, is the orange van shoes, the LRG hat, miscellaneous clothing, most more important, uh, the Husky uh, tool set, miscellaneous truck parts, uh, the USB game console, uh, a handmade toy box for his grandfather, and his fishing gear. Those will be returned. Uh, we'll do that by arrangement. And then the riding lawnmower is an issue, and that'll be reserved for. Settlement or truck. Okay. okay. Uh, regarding incomes and support, neither party has filed, they're both pro se, neither party has filed any kind of financial documentation. They both make about the same around four. Correction, times. Your Honor. I filed one in February. Okay. Let me hear from him and then you can have your input. Let me let me rephrase. Nothing up to date. So what we're going to do is just simply exchange the financial information, including uh, health insurance premium uh, information. And uh, we will I request that we reserve that and kick that. I'm only available on March 5th, I believe. I'm out for the next three weeks. So we will revisit that and set that once we have the information. Um, the There's another issue. The My client is off of the lease. My client is off of the utilities. Uh, proof will be shown regarding that. That's easy enough to check. And my client will take uh, wife off of the car insurance. She has her own insurance. Uh, decision making is joint. That's been agreed. Um, the uh, the guardian ad litem request by my client is off the table. Transfers will continue to be done at the Longview Police Station. And there are two issues. One, my client is requesting 50 50 parenting time uh, because uh, I don't know. Do you have the opportunity to read my client's declaration? Uh, there's essentially there's no reason not to. My client has had substantial time with the child. If the court does not order that. Uh, the parties agree to continue to follow the, uh, it's, it's, a, it's kind of an unusual 10 day uh, parenting time agreement that was reached in mediation. I'm not offering it as evidence out of mediation, but that's what they've agreed to. 
with a review in May. Uh, again, my client is asking for 50-50, but as a fallback, he would reach the meeting. Uh, there's an agreement that there will be no contact between uh, the child, Tegan, with Luke and Tiffany Kennaway. And the other issue is, uh, or my uh, opposing has uh, two sisters, Chloe and Shaylin. My client has requested uh, not no contact with them, but no alone contact with them. With the rest of the family, it's okay, but he's requesting that Tegan not be with either one of those individually and alone. So there's two issues before the court. Okay, so let me make sure it's about the visits, visitation time or schedule. The 50-50 versus the 10-day the mediated agreement. Okay, and yeah. what was the other one? The second was my client's requesting uh, no individual alone time between Tegan, the child, and Chloe or and or Shailen. Okay, so do you agree with everything he said except for the two issues of what the residential time would be and the no contact between Tegan and Shayla or Correct. Chloe? Correct. Okay, all I, right. So let me hear from you on that. Um, so the first issue, the um, uh, Shayla and Chloe, I just, I don't understand why they would suddenly not be allowed to be alone with Tegan. Tegan is seven years old. They've been a part of his life since he was born. Um, when Lucas and I were still together and co-parenting and stuff, he had no problem reaching out to Shaylin to say, hey, can you watch him so we can go do something? Um, Shaylin's also, she works for the school district. She goes through numerous background checks every year. She was licensed to run her own in-home daycare. Like she is not a harm or a safety concern for a child. So don't understand that sudden change. Similarly to Chloe. Yes, Chloe is 15. She's gone through some stuff. There was a CPS case, as he mentioned. However, that's been completely dismissed. All of that the entire court case was completely dismissed. Chloe doesn't babysit him anyways. So I guess it doesn't, I guess Chloe, I mean, but still, I just don't understand why that would be where the concern is. And what about the residential schedule? So as for that, I just, so since January of 2023, Tegan has resided in the home with me, except for every other weekend. And technically in our parenting plan, we had Wednesdays as well. However, at the time, Lucas wasn't able to make that work between the school schedule and his job at the time. And so he wasn't having him on Wednesdays. He'd have him for like a couple hours Wednesday evening, but then send him home to me, even though he was supposed to have overnight Wednesdays. Um, and then we went to mediation and agreed because they both wanted more time together. So we agreed in mediation that we would, up until May, we decided from December to May, we were going to do this 10 days. So the second Friday of the month, 10 days after. So that would give him the full weekend, a full school week and full weekend. And then Tegan would come back to our house on my home on Sunday. The reason that I think that that is an important schedule for him is our son is potentially on the autism spectrum. We don't know that for sure. We actually have an appointment on the 13th uh, down at Jordan Becker's to have that evaluation completed for autism and ADHD. And I do not believe that it is in Tegan's best interest to transition households on a school day. Transition days are hard enough for him. He's always a little bit more on edge on the days that he transitions between households. And so I, when we were talking about it, trying to figure out a way to work it out so that Tegan and Lucas were able to have more time together, I figured this would work out so that Tegan's not suffering through transitioning on a weekend, but also dad's getting, they get a full 10 days together, full two weekends and the school week. And so I just don't, I, and, and we agreed to mediation on the 11th, I believe. And then three days later, he turned in the motion for this. And so I just, I don't, I don't understand. Anything else? No, you're not. My client's reasons are on page 15 of the proposed parent plan. Okay. So in regard to the visitation, uh, and I was looking at this overall, uh, I had concerns and reading all the materials and, and that, but I'm not going to get into that because it sounds like you're in the middle of trying to settle this and I'm, and I'll leave it at that. What I was going to do is uh, go Friday to Friday. Uh, and so Friday at five to Friday at five. And that's when the child would alternate. Uh, so Friday, that Friday at five. Okay. So week on, week off. Kira? When would we begin? So with the mediation agreement and the schedule that we had kind of established, um, Tegan would be going to dad's on Friday. They'd be, and then they'd start their 10 day. So would it just be so starting it's this Friday? Days, it's I know. Friday to Friday. Yeah. yeah. I'm just saying they would have, if we were doing the mediation thing, that Friday, this Friday would have been when Tegan went over there. So are we starting this Friday? He'll be with dad. That would be fine if dad wants to start this Friday at five. Yes, your honor. And go and then alternate 
And if Keegan is having that kind of trouble, I can tell you my experience is get a calendar, circle those for Keegan, uh, and they just see it if you want it. I can't remember how old Keegan is now. It's not very old, but um, you can use colors at this point, and that way Keegan can just say, you know, see it, go to daddy's here, go to mommy's here. It's really easy. Okay. Okay, uh, and then in regard to Chloe, no unsupervised time with Chloe. I think there are issues that have been going on, uh, and so no unsupervised with Chloe. She can see Tegan, just not unsupervised. Shayla, I don't see any issue or reason to limit that. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Can I, what should I do about presenting an order? So do you want to set it on? Uh, for a week out, or do you want to get it or I, just I, note it up if there's an issue? Please, yeah, I'll be in the air on the 13th, I'll be in the air on the 20th, 27th. Okay. Just class. note it up if you can not agree. Okay. Will I get a copy or anything? Oh, no, you have to. So, yeah. what happens is he'll prepare an order that reflects all your agreement and what I've ruled on, and then um, he'll send it to you. And if you agree that that's what I ruled and that's what you agreed on, then you sign off on it. It gets sent over for my signature and it gets filed with the court. Thank okay? you for walking me if through. If you don't agree to what he says, then it needs to be back in front of the court. Okay. Thank you for walking me through that. Um, one final question, just kind of relevant, kind of irrelevant. He was talking about my proof that I'd removed Lucas from the lease. I happened to, I did bring that one with me today. I forgot to bring the utilities. Should I get that to you guys now or just file it? At the well, we don't disagree. We we're fine with the office okay. part. Okay, we'll just, just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. And I, and just so the court knows on the record, I will reset this for the child support hearing. Okay. Hoffman, if necessary. Hoffman. All right. Thank you. you. Your Honor, this is on for several matters. Um, the first one I would ask the court to, to uh, enter the order I submitted, the proposed order. I've served it on council on the 30th. There's nothing been he hasn't filed any objections or stated any objections. So I would ask the court to enter that order and then we can address those other issues. Mr. Anagnosti, you okay to put approved via Zoom? Um, uh, yes, Your Honor. I, I, I do want to indicate that, um, you know, we just got this order and local court rules require a week and then, you know, I'm supposed to file an objection, but um, <laughs> we, we've been handling other issues in this case. And and, and I think the, the order reflects your ruling. Well, that's incorrect. He was served on the 30th, Your Honor. And if the okay. court it wants doesn't to... doesn't matter. I'm signing it. It's done. Let's move Thank on. You. It's also on for, uh, I believe, Mr. Anagnostu's motion and my um, request for uh, further terms for failure to comply with discovery. Which would your honor like to hear first or from from who first? So the failure to comply. So I need to, Ms. Cotto, I believe these are your motion. Failure Thank you. The, the, I have a motion that the court granted, I believe, on the uh, a couple of weeks ago where Ms. Um, Hoffman was ordered it, through her counsel to give me discovery by January 31st at 5 p.m. Um, what happened on uh, at three o'clock on January 1st or January 31st was I've got an email which I submitted to the court in my materials stating that nothing was that um, I needed to sign a modified restraining order that I hadn't seen previously or a modified protective order. Otherwise, I would not get the materials. I was out of the office, so I didn't see it to probably close to five. So I didn't get any uh, discovery. So the next day, I sent an email saying, not going to sign the order because it's a modification. And I uh, did not get any um, discovery on the first. In fact, I got a um, not only a motion for protective order, but I got an order shortening time. Mr. Anagnostu did not serve anything, no supplemental at all, including the information that uh, might be deemed um, not sensitive. So I've got, I have nothing. And the problem is that um, we have this ongoing issue where um, I, I can't get the discovery. I've done 326 eyes, um, two hours before it's due, I get this, sign the protective order and I get nothing. And here's the problem is uh, we're coming up on trial. This, this was served on the parties in September. You granted this two weeks ago. I haven't gotten a call. I haven't gotten anything except for the 31st is when I got my first communication and then this this uh, motion for shortening time. Um, 
under the case law, and I uh, submitted uh, materials to the court, I did submit a bench copy because I thought that I would get it by now. But the bench copy under Burton, it indicates that there's that the court has the ability under uh, CR 37 to um, impose extreme sanctions and it's CR 37 B. Uh, there's two, there's several different ways that the court can go. One of them being striking all pleadings uh, of the offending party and an order refusing to allow the offending party to support or oppose designated claims of, or defenses. So what we've got here under the case law, it says these are extreme and that there's three things that have to be proven, which I would submit to the court or have been proven. There has to be deliberate and willful violation of the discovery order, which was clearly willful and deliberate. Um, I was told that unless I signed this protective order, I don't get my discovery. I didn't get anything. And there were two pages that we presented to the court last hearing showing all the information that was not uh, responded to the documents that weren't provided. And then, so we've got a, a willful violation. We also have prejudice to my client. We have a trial date set for March 11th. It's impossible for me even to prepare. I mean, I can't do, you know, requests for admissions. I haven't seen anything to note whether or not Ms. Hoffman has, has completed all the documentation and given her history, unlikely everything was provided. So I'm sure we're going to be back with to the court. As it was, if she had submitted it as agreed on January 8th, I might have had a chance to uh, get my documents reviewed. But now I'm going to be behind the eight ball. And Ms. Hoffman has no motivation to get me this information. She right now has placement of the child. Um, she can just keep delaying. And this has been a pattern throughout this case. Delay, not provide, have us go to court. And then the last third uh, thing that I must show is that lesser sanctions have been com uh, considered. And we got lesser sanctions two weeks ago when the court ordered her to pay $1,500 in fees. So there, there's just nothing else left to do. And so Ms. Hoffman just continues to violate the court order, uh, violate uh, what you have ordered, refuse to give me information, and I'm just out of things to do. And so I, I would submit to the court that unless something very serious is done, that we're going to continue to have this pro tr problem. My trial is going to be continued because I'm not prepared. Um, there's a number of allegations um, that have gone back and forth, but I would also tell the court that my client has not uh, disseminated any information, um, but, and I did respond into the court. I have a chance to read my, uh, my materials. I did. Okay. And my apologies for the late, uh, the late submission, because I got this document on, um, on Friday. So what happens, what's happened now is because of the shortening time, because of the nature of what's going on, I was forced to give up my weekend and spend the entire weekend, uh, dealing with this matter. So I'm asking for very significant fees. Um, I'm asking for striking of the pleadings or in the alternative, negative inferences. Ms. Hoffman is not come to the party. She's not complying with discovery. She didn't hold a part of it back. She held everything back. And I would like the court to note that my client had discovery due and it was due. I believe we supplied it in December. We supplied documentation of bank records, medical records, piles of information, and we can't get anything. So I would ask the court for uh, the relief I'm requesting under the discovery. Now, does the court want me to address the, the uh, protection order or wait until Mr. Um, Anagnostu argues his point? He can, let's go, he can make his request and then we'll address that next. So let's talk about the discovery, Mr. Anagnostu. Maybe they're so combined, I'm not sure, but let's see. I think they are combined, but. Okay. So your honor, uh, just briefly, I wanna indicate how we got to this point. Um, counsel and I had a, a CR 26i. We've we've had a CR 26i, and and during that conversation, we agreed uh, to a protective order. Now, counsel in her recent brief uh, has brought up contract law and various other things. I mean, contracts, as I recall from law school, require like nine elements. You have to have an offer and acceptance and consideration, uh, and then you know it can't be illegal and various other things. Uh, this isn't a contract. This is a CR 26i order, um, and and counsel agreed to that, and she prepared the order. Um, and so this was in uh, early January. Uh, we had the CR 26i. We complied with the rule, um, and uh, we came up with an agreement when discovery would be. Uh, and unfortunately, after that, I got COVID, uh, and I was out for a week. I tried to explain that uh, at, at the last hearing. 
uh, we come back and it's a three day weekend. And immediately following the three day weekend, I'm, I can't get to my office for three days because I'm iced in. I, I can't get out of my driveway uh, because of the ice storm. So we come back from that uh, and your order issues uh, the order saying that we had to answer by the 31st. And, and my staff and I, we, we are getting documents from my client. She lives in in Idaho, and um, uh, she works, and, and she had to, to to make the time to go to the bank and uh, and go to her medical providers, and, and we got all the stuff prepared, uh, and and here's the discovery, it's ready to go, uh, and I contact uh, Miss Kudo uh, about the protective order that we agreed to, uh, as you know, it's an order of the court. She prepared it. Uh, and, you know, she said I, in her response now that I made substantial changes to it. I didn't make substantial changes to it. All I did was add um, a remedies clause for violation. That, that's all it said is that a violation of this order will subject the violating party to attorney's fees and costs together with other. I mean, it, it's implied in the order anyway. It's not a substantial change. I didn't change any words. I just added a, a, a remedies clause uh, and signed it and got it back to her. Uh, the agreement was we would we would sign this protective order, uh, and then I would um, uh, release my client's discovery because there has been abuses in the past. Um, uh, there have been relentless attacks, and this is another example of a relentless attack. Uh, every other word is an attack on me. Um, and in the in the past, you know, Mr. Hoffman has attacked counselors. He's attacked the former GAL, and now they're attacking me. Uh, making it, um, you know, very difficult uh, to represent a client when I'm just trying to get through this. I, I have the documents ready to go. They were ready on the 31st per your order. I, I asked her to sign the CR 26I agreed protective order. And all of a sudden she says, no, we're not going to sign that. We want to publish this uh, on the internet or, you know, give it to friends and family. I mean, I'm not sure what the objection is. Uh, and uh, so, um, you know, very quickly, uh, we did the motion uh, for the protective order that we agreed to in, in the uh, CR 26I, the one that Ms. Uh, Kudo prepared. Uh, and, you know, I had a had a one page motion and a one page uh, request for shortened time, which were granted on, I served her on Thursday. We had this conversation on Wednesday and that's when uh, the next day she tells me, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to comply with that protective order uh, that we agreed to. Um, so I, I quickly do this motion uh, and uh, get a shortened time, get that to counsel. And I receive a five page response um, and a five page brief and a declaration of um, Mr. Hoffman, who says, I have never put anything on the internet. So then my client submits uh, and we filed that, uh, you know, after the fact, well, here's a here's a post that he put on Facebook alleging that I am bipolar. Now let's see, is, is does bipolar care with it, carry with it some kind of stigma? social stigma. Yeah, I think it does, you know, and that's what Mr. Hoffman does. Um, and, uh, you know, that was just one document that she could come up on a very short notice uh, as of, because uh, we got this response Monday, and then I got that from her. And here we are Tuesday, the very next day. So, um, Your Honor, I, I the, the documents are ready to go. I signed the order that counsel prepared. I did add a provision for remedies, uh, and I am ruthlessly, you know, attacked uh, you know, counsel, counsel, counsel doesn't know, uh, you know, what I'm doing or uh, have complied with the law or, you know, what's going on. We had a 26 hour, 26 I conference where we agreed that these parties need a protection order uh, with regards to disseminating. I've been operating under that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we go to ask for it to be formal uh, and they object. So apparently they never intended uh, to honor that, or at least at this point, they don't want to honor. They want to publish all these answers, my client's medical records and my client's bank statements and everything else that they've asked for uh, to third parties or on the internet. That's what the order specifically says, that it's not to be released, uh, you know, in any kind of public uh, electronic format, uh, you know. So uh, I, I have, <laughs> this is this is what I believe, Your Honor. Uh, this is, uh, we've already gotten the guardian ad litem recommendation. And if Mr. Hoffman is not going to win on the facts, he's going to win on, he's going to win on procedure. He's going to put me through scorched earth and my staff through scorched earth. Uh, you know, from your ruling, 
to to the when we had these due, it was about uh, a week, a little over a week, uh, and um, uh, we got the answers put together. I contacted counsel, and they have created an issue with regards to the CR twenty six I that we had and a protective order. Uh, and um, uh, my client is is working hard to comply. I'm under attack relentlessly by counsel getting filed declarations filed repeatedly. I, I need the court's help. Um, we're ready to deliver these documents. We are ready on the 31st. Uh, we just need the, the protective order that we agreed to that this doesn't, all these medical records and stuff that my client's providing isn't put on the internet. Ms. Cota? Well, first of all, Mr. Anagnosto has misrepresented to the court that CR 26I. And if you look at my previous information, which I filed with the court, on my motion to compel, it was exhibit C, and it, it was an email to Mr. Anagnosto saying, as per our CR 26, I, our third one, that he would have the information um, to the parties. This was on November 31st. He will have the information discovered to me by January 8th. So that protective order was not part of that conversation. And I sent that protective order to Mr. Anagnosto in January as a as a an attempt to avoid a motion to compel. And again, in my previous documentation, I showed the court that he didn't reply. He did not reply. So that's never been a conversation. Now, Mr. Anagnos was also misleading the court, that, claiming we had an, a conversation on the 31st of January. We did not. We had no conversation other than an email that says, if I don't sign what he's proposing, then he will be um, he won't deliver the information. That was before the court. The reason why I did my certification is to show the court what happened. It wasn't an attack on counsel. It was, here's the facts. Here's what we've done and gone through it. It wasn't Mr. Um, Hoffman doing the attack. The bottom line is with, with the information, Mr. Anagnostu is claiming that this protective order, which I proposed back the 1st of January or the 8th, 3rd of January to get my information, he didn't respond at all. I it, I it was a dead issue as far as I was concerned because he didn't respond to the protective order. We had to do the motion to compel. In the motion to compel, he didn't provide anything in writing. And then the protective order wasn't ruled on, wasn't discussed or anything. And one of the things on a protective order was, as I indicated in my materials, that on the protective order, if we don't agree, we have to have a CR 26I. I Mr. Anagnostu doesn't follow the rules. And for him to say that I'm attacking him, I'm not. I'm sorry that these things have occurred, but I am, don't have staff. I do it myself, which means I spend my nights and weekends working on this stuff. But what I did, and, and this is the first time I have heard anything claim, and I, Mr. Anagnosto has absolutely no evidence of a conversation we had regarding a CR 26I on this protective order. He, way back when, he threw it out and said, well, maybe I'll go to the judge. Maybe I'll go to protect, protect, protective order. And he did nothing. He didn't even write a response to my motion to compel. And so now he's saying, oh, yeah, we talked about it. We did not. And if you look at the materials submitted, there is nothing in my uh, documentation or his that indicates that there was an agreement on a protective order. They sent it. He didn't respond. Then he takes it and modifies it two hours before it's due. I don't think I saw that email till close to five o'clock. My client is out of state also, so I didn't have a chance to review it with him. I then reviewed it later that evening and thought, no, this is a complete modification. I don't agree with this. But Mr. Anagnosto had time for the two weeks prior from your order to the 31st. He could have called me. He could have said a CR 26I on this protective order. We could have discussed it. No, he actually held the documents hostage. I got nothing. And as far as uh, disseminating information, the, the information that uh, Mr. Anagnosto gave me, one, the um, there there's not doc there are not documents. I was forced to stay, and my client submitted a declaration this morning that I had to fax to the parties because I got this information from Mr. Anagnosto at 1:30 yesterday afternoon, and it shows that the the information that he's claiming shows my client is going to disseminate information it is not um, is not relevant. He it, there's a couple of very um, kind of vague. Um, Here's the website for this. Doesn't mention who it's about, what it's about. It's 10 years old. The second issue was he, he posted a review three years ago. He tells you that. And Miss Ms. Hoffman, if anybody's violated orders, she has. I mean, she has disseminated information. 
we have provided proof. Wrap this up. Okay. So um, the only thing is that my client has not violated uh, that Mr. Anagnostu protection order should be denied. He hasn't followed the rules. I follow the rules each and every time. He does not. And I'm asking the court to deny the request for a protective order and deny a request based on uh, all these things I've listed and award attorney's fees. We're happy to deal with that also. Thank you. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I did review the uh, rules in regard to the protection, uh, protective order uh, in regard to the 26I. Uh, and I'm also looking at what's gone on here. Uh, I, I don't like the idea that it's taken this long to get the discovery that's been requested. Don't think it's appropriate. Uh, and to then get it just right before the time of trial and hold on to it uh, is not appropriate either. If there was going to be a request for a protective order, it should have been done a long time ago. Uh, and so uh, with that, protective orders are to protect the parties. They're to protect their, their privacy. And we know in domestic cases and a lot of other cases that their life is out for display. Uh, people are angry, people are willing to do whatever they want to do uh, and without because of the anger and the emotions that go on. Uh, and so I'm going to do a protective order, but I'm going to make it mutual. Uh, neither party is to uh, in any way uh, put on social media. Uh, I'm assuming I don't have the protective order that's been proposed in, in, in front of me. Uh, but I, I'm going to order that protective order, except that it needs to be mutual. I am going to have the language that Mr. Anagnostu has added. Uh, and so that, in turn, Mr. Anagnostu, get those documents over to Ms. Cotto uh, and uh, get them over to her uh, as quickly uh, by today. Yeah, we, um, we can have them to her today, Your Honor. Okay, get them to Ms. Cotto uh, as far as those documents. I'm going to set this on next week, Ms. Cotto, for the idea that I want you to hopefully have time. Uh, to go through those documents and see if there is anything else that is missing uh, out of those documents. If there's anything missing, you need to understand next Tuesday, I will be ordering that no testimony will be uh, allowed in regard to those matters or presented as evidence of those matters that have not been provided. Uh, that's the intent of this court. Uh, so I'm not going to be striking or doing anything. I, uh, I will be uh, prohibiting that testimony or the entry of evidence. Uh, which is also allowed by the rules. So uh, in regard to costs, the court does find uh, that Mr. Anagnostu's client or whatever's been going on uh, has not acted appropriately, that it's taken additional time that should have been done months ago. Uh, and instead of it's just right before trial getting done. So I am going to order $2,000 in attorney's fees. Uh, that's to be paid within 120 days by Mr. Anagnostu's client to Ms. Cotto. Uh, for the time and the efforts that Ms. Cotto has had to put into uh, preparing the, the pleadings uh, and pursuing this. Your Honor, one thing, well, I think we can discuss it next week in regards to the testimony, because my client would be providing testimony. It would just be precluding the uh, petitioner from providing testimony, correct? Correct. Wait, Thank I'm you. Sorry, run that by me again. So in regard to if something hasn't been provided, your client will not be allowed to testify as to uh, that matter uh, at trial. Correct. Right. I, I understand that. There's no testimony to, uh, next week. No, no. Okay. He was just talking about the details. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will prepare an order um, and get that to Mr. Anagnostu. Okay. And I look forward to receiving the documents today. Thank you. And the court is ordering that the discovery be sent over today. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Okay. That's it. And, All right, thank you. And my understanding, Your Honor, are you going to prepare the, the protective order or are you going to use Ms. Kudos or, or the one I... I'm using Ms. Kudos form, but it needs to be made mutual. Well, it is. The party is too. So it applies to both parties. Right. Uh, the, the one okay. she prepared is mutual. Okay, well, we I can type in Mr. Anagnostu's language into my proposed order and I will, I will finish preparing it. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Counsel, thank you. go ahead. And thank you, Your Honor. Support right. aware, I do represent the petitioner and moving party in the motion for temporary orders uh, before you this morning, uh, namely Katie Hansen. Here on a, a couple different issues. Number one, and most importantly, my client is a temporary parenting plan and process for these children, uh, Bo, who was 12, and Brooke, who was 11, uh, as well as uh, some financial relief, which is uh, much needed. Start by noting that these parties were married back on October 3rd of 2010. Now, recently separated the first of December of 2013, making this roughly a 13-year marriage uh, or thereabouts. 
you have a complete swearing match um, back and forth between the parties as to level of involvement and history with the children and current circumstances. Uh, what you don't have any discrepancy on is where these parties stand today. Uh, and basically the history uh, related to each uh, aspect of what they did uh, during the relationship with these two kids who are well-adjusted uh, to good, two good children. Uh, my client has essentially uh, dedicated her life to kind of being available for these kids. Uh, she's a paraeducator at the Toodle School District where both kids attend. Uh, that was by design of the parties uh, years ago. Uh, my client details for you, and there's very little uh, to refute the fact that she has been the primary custodian for these kids. Uh, she's taken that to the doctor's appointments. She's been readily available for the school uh, in life. Uh, she's taken that to sports. She's done those types of things, again, as a, a, any good parent and involved parent would do, and that's not disputed. Uh, where we are today is dad, you know, which, again, is not uncommon in these types of cases, uh, comes forth and says, well, I, I, I'm involved, uh, too, to an extent, just as much as Katie. That's just not true from my client's perspective. Uh, Mr. Hansen, to his credit, has been involved with sports. Uh, he's taken the kids in sports. He is passionate about the sports. Uh, he's, in our estimation, uh, bridged that gap and, and overcome the uh, line of involvement and almost an obsession. Uh, again, we tell you about the stress that's been placed on these kids uh, to achieve at, uh, uh, in sports and in extracurricular activities. Dad takes it very seriously. Uh, my client details for you, and again, this is an issue that the GAO will need to uh, fully investigate and look through, uh, assuming one is appointed, as to the involvement and kind of the healthy nature of that, and whether there's any boundaries that have been crossed. Uh, my client had details for you as well. Uh, some of the nature that we picked are related to dad and his kids with their sports uh, certainly goes into the relationship between the spouses. My client details for you, and again, dad, uh, as expected, uh, denies that. Uh, this is one where she was basically along for the ride. Uh, the concern with this, and she's lived 13 years in very traditional type roles uh, where she cares for the kids. Dad, who works at J.H. Kelly, has done so for an extended period of time has been the primary breadwinner for the family, and they've used her income just kind of to supplement uh, a lot of the things that a dad likes to do. Uh, so if we look at this, uh, my client tells you that she has had very little access to uh, financial decisions. She's had very little access to decision-making in general as it relates to major purchases. And my client tells you that she had no idea that there was even parcels of property that were being purchased. She tells you that she never used a credit card in 13 years of marriage and that rather that he's the one that's doing these things and taking out lines of credit and such so that he can pursue some of his activities, which is hunting, which is fishing, which is outdoors like stuff, which is guns, which is uh, certainly something that I will uh, uh, address here momentarily uh, and the like where she's basically with the kids. He gives her communication when she says, well, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, the kids are basically your domain. My domain is work and money and providing for the family, which to his credit, he's done a good job of for 13 years. But we have those very traditional roles that uh, Mr. Hansen has unilaterally decided this is going to be the way it is. And you're basically along for the ride. Take care of the kids. Stay out of the way. That's where we're at from a uh, stepping off. My client details for you uh, some concerns about that. And, and we've given you just uh, the, 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 a small list of those. Uh, when she left the residence, she took essentially a bag full of her clothes out of fear of how he was going to respond. Uh, again, how does he respond? He contacts law enforcement. He's done that more than once to the best of our knowledge. Uh, makes threats to my client. Uh, he goes to her uh, place of employment, basically corners her in the classroom and says, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to get joint custody. We're going to have 50-50 custody because that's the way I want it to the point where she's there, um, basically being browbeaten for the better part of close to an hour, leaves emotional when he finally allows her to and, and walks out. He then uh, tells her um, to the point of, of the plan in, in past communications and when she said, I'm not going to pay support financially, uh, you're going to have to be independent. Uh, basis kind of this notion around what the parenting plan should be, which in his estimation is 50-50. We have other instances which again show some of these controlling like uh, mechanisms. We have the issue at the exchange in which they find it. And again, she's basically under his control. Here's what the parenting plan is going to be for January. Here's what we're going to do. How does that go? Now, he tells her we're going to meet at the Chevron station uh, in on West Side Highway. That's where she's at. She's there first. She parks in a spot uh, readily uh, available uh, under the lights where he can readily see her. He pulls right by her with the kids on exchange, goes to the corner part of that parking lot, says to the kids, well, if your mom wants to get you, she'll come over here and do it. 
Again, these are nothing more than control that the kids don't need to be exposed to, that my client doesn't need to be subjected to, but this is grown routine. Uh, we also have the, the communication where he says, you can't have any of your family, you can't have third parties at these exchanges, again, because I don't essentially want them to be there. Why is that communication being brought? My client tells you, and I think it's pretty clear from looking at these cases over the extended history, because he wants to be able to, again, dictate to her what she's going to do. He wants this sense of control. We look at the other stuff, uh, and, and again, I think there's the, the list is not exhaustive, uh, where he uh, tells my client, despite the 11-year-old child having gallbladder surgery, we're still going to have this joint parenting plan. We're just going to need to figure out a way to do it. Again, so he can set uh, a precipice that, listen, we have a joint plan. When he goes into court, he can sit there and state, yep, it's been joint, and we've worked through these things without telling you, basically, it's because I'm demanding that she do these things, because that's what I've done for 13 years, and that's how the way I want it to be. He also involves the children in certain things. He asks the children about uh, what, what, what's your mother doing, where's she at, uh, these different types of things. Again, I would certainly uh, state that that is unnecessary to do. It's certainly not in the best interest of the children to put them in this conflict when they're already going through transition. But dad just kind of shows that he's not going to stop, uh, that he's going to continue uh, to do that. He goes so far that, as to, again, he states in his declaration how involved he is and what he's done. It's the same person who's only been to three appointments over 12 years so related to medical appointments for these kids. It's the same person who states to my client, I don't want the kids getting checked out for ADHD, and I'm, I'm referencing Bo more at IEP. And I have, to object. I have to object to this statement. It was in, contained within the reply, and my client didn't have any opportunity to respond to that. We adamantly deny that statement. Well, that's in direct response to him being involved as a parent. So we can certainly include that in the reply because it's in uh, sir reply to what he states. Certainly alleging that my client didn't want to uh, um, approach a, a medical condition of the child is completely different than being responsive. It's a con completely new allegation. I'm sorry. So you're asking that he what? That he not? He's including the kids. This is part of the behavior of the control right. where he doesn't want uh, to have any kind of diagnosis of the kids medically or otherwise that could impact his governance. Oh, okay. That's right. So, Ms. Gilmore, you're saying that your client hasn't had a right to respond to that? That was contained within the reply declaration. So, no, my client didn't have the opportunity to respond. I remember reading it, but I... Right, anyway, that's that's one of about 10 different examples we give you. So, okay. if you want to consider it great, if not, that's fine. Okay, too. go ahead. Uh, but overall, with things, you get this type of dominance and exerting control over the situation from everything to guns, which, again, I, I will address shortly, to the parenting aspects, to the fact of the child having gallbladder removed, and dad says, no, we're going to stick with that 50-50 plan. Again, trying to preserve what? His right to not pay support. And then, unfortunately, it was Alan McDean. Same person who hasn't allowed access to uh, finances, who had really given my client very little as it pertains to that. These are issues. The reason we bring these up, and it's important to know, is because we've got my client who's essentially asking on the parenting plan that the status quo, uh, that the traditional roles of these parents related to the kids remain, versus someone who says, no, I want a 50-50 plan, and that's the way it's going to be. Court's well versed with what makes a successful joint parenting plan. Number one on that list, and there's, I bet Yale's tell me there's only a checklist you go through on that. Number one on that is one party's control and exerting said control and dominance over the other party. We have that. I think it's 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 very evident. Another one of those is free communication between the parties. That's been an issue. The fact that my client takes a, a laundry bag or a garbage sack full of clothes and leaves shows you that there is some of this uh, permeating throughout the course of this relationship which again is going to impact their ability to have a successful joint plan. Similar areas with discipline, a similar uh, track records of engagement with schools and counselors and doctors and the like. We don't have any of that. So if we're looking for a joint parenting plan, it's not in the best kid, the kids' best interest that's being proposed by Mr. Hansen. It's in his own financial best interest that he's doing. That. Again, we look at the fact that he's taken a month or, or, or nearly a month to travel and go hunting around Thanksgiving. Spends it uh, uh, in a different state with friends, hunting and, and doing outdoors, which again, good for him. But at the cost of spending that month with his family, I mean, he knows that they're going to transition and a potential uh, separation. That's kind of where we're at with that. So I think if we take a step and look globally at this, which manner is going to uh, best provide for the kids on where we stand today on February 6th, it's the most least amount of disruption for them. And that would be accommodating the traditional roles of these families. This family has had in effect for the better part of 12 years. That's what we proposed on the parenting plan side. In time, hopefully this gets to a joint plan. Hopefully they learn to communicate. Hopefully they go through the steps. Hopefully the emotion of the uh, 13 year relationship um, going away. But we are not near there yet. 
with the subject these kids to a joint plan. And when, when dad's proposing that exclusively for his own interest, again, I, I think would be um, not, the, not the way not the best go about that. So we are asking that dad have visits with the kids, uh, one overnight per week. And we're open to suggestions on that, whether that be a Saturday overnight to a Sunday. Alternatively, my client tells you she's agreeable to an every other weekend, pending information from the GAO, which clearly could change things. That's the parenting plan, and we believe that that is being promoted with the best interest of these two kids. As it relates to financial assistance, and again, my client is in desperate need of them. There's no dispute that Mr. Hansen earns significantly more than my client. We've provided updated uh, worksheets for you when uh, my office was when my client nets about $1,700 per month. Uh, Mr. Uh, takes home significantly more than that. Uh, Mr. is making about $9,000 per month gross. That's going to leave him somewhere in that $7,000 net per month range. From that, they have a house payment. He's got a line of credit. Uh, he's got a, I believe, a $600 there about per month uh, truck payment uh, on his side of the ledger. He spends the money, he earns the money. Again, that's kind of how this has is, 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 uh, progressed. He's uh, voluntarily contributing over $500 per month to a 401k account. Uh, he's got these, uh, again, a fascination and a hobby with guns and outdoors and hunting and fishing and the like. That all comes at a cost. For him to suggest in his responsive pleadings that my client essentially live off her uh, parents, to live off of credit that she's never had in 13 years, while he's out maintaining the lifestyle he's enjoyed, again, uh, a reeks of someone who, again, wants to exert control and financial dominance over a spouse of, of 13 plus years. That's concerning. We do believe that this is a spousal maintenance case. You now we're asking for $1,600 per month in support, in addition to the child support uh, pursuant to our worksheets. Again, that comes in at $1,615, uh, depending on what the court does with the parity plan and the schedule. Also asking for a contribution in visa costs in the amount of $3,000. My client tells you, and there's very little dispute, that she left with the clothes on her back and a bag full of stuff, and has been relying for the last uh, two plus months now um, her family, who's uh, present in the courtroom, as well as basically just trying to find ways uh, to make ends meet. She's renting a place in Longview you know, that's suitable and comfortable for the two kids. That comes at an expense. She's going to have electric bills. She's going to have cell phones. Oh, by the way, she now has a line specifically for him due to the communication, communication issues in the past. She's taking on uh, food and care for three individuals as opposed to the one in Mr. Hansen's house. We do believe that uh, getting some transitionary maintenance established on a temporary basis as well as child support we want to lump those together and call it family support and we're agreeable to that but she significantly needs uh, some help on the financial end lastly now, this has struck me in review of mr hansen's uh, pleas my client tells you he's got over 50 guns at his disposal she also tells you that she has concerns that certain things are going to go missing whether that be accounts and we've got questions on, on one of the accounts for the long short credit union or guns or gun saves or the cash in the safe or anything of value. She tells you she's fearful of them. In response to that, Mr. Hansen doesn't tell you that's not happening. He tells you, well, for the past 13 years, we've had this giant gun safe and it's been filled with 50 uh, rifles and uh, firearms. I'm just essentially acting as a, as a good friend and keeping that for my buddies. Highly unlikely that that is true. If he's going to go to that extent to try to conceal what's in that gun safe, the fact that, well, I, I've been doing this for 13 years, acting as a storage facility for my buddies and their firearms. Meanwhile, submits to you pictures of him out in the woods with high-end rifles. Credibility certainly is an issue. Is he being forthright? Is he being honest? My client details and tells you absolutely not. And if he's going to um, not be honest or forthright with something as, at this point, minuscule as the firearms, the guns, the gun safe, what is it he's telling you about his time and his interactions with the kids that probably was a little bit skewed uh, to his advantage in, in colorful language and details for you in his declaration? That's kind of where we are. We're asking that everything just be where it's at, uh, that nobody dispose of any property. Again, the, the garden variety type of restraining orders, I think probably apply and are appropriate in this case. And then the relief as we've requested. GAL should be split according to the percentage of the incomes on the uh, worksheets. And again, if we set a review for three or four or five months out, whatever that is, hopefully the final report would be done by then. But if we track it, uh, I think that's probably uh, behooves everybody in this. And if we get to the point where these two can have, uh, go through the checklist of an effective joint plan, and there not be these control issues, and these kids you know, evolve and start to be able to go back and forth in between houses successfully, then we can open the door on expanding that time. But where we sit right now in a review of what he has filed and submitted to this court, uh, it, it reeks of somewhat dishonesty, especially with this gun issue, and especially with his uh, uh, comments related to past uh, influence with the kids. 
Ms. Gilmore? Thank you, Your Honor. For the record, Megan Gilmore on behalf of the respondent and non-moving party, namely Jason Hansen. First, I would like to again note my objection to the um, new information contained within the reply declaration. Again, my client adamantly denies making any sort of statements that's contained in that declaration, and we ask the court not to consider it. Um, petitioner attempts to malign my client's character within her statements. But there's absolutely no evidence to prove that he was anything but a good father and a good husband. Looking to the timeline of this case, my client was an extremely involved father in and outside of the children's activities. My client, as well as third parties, detail the length and the nature and extent of the children's relationship with my client. None of these third parties, including individuals that actually coached with my client, expressed any concern about my client's parenting or coaching. My client takes the children to and from their events, coaches their activities, does homework with them, does other activities outside of extracurriculars, and spends nearly every minute with his family. Um, again, this information about doctor's appointments is contained within the reply. There's no evidence that my client has only attended three doctor's appointments. Again, in her reply, petitioner attempts to paint my client as an absentee father because he went on a hunting trip. Again, this wasn't for a month, it was for two weeks, and she conveniently fails to acknowledge that the party's son was with, the, with my client for 11 days. During the vast majority of that trip, my client was responsible for not only his care, but having the child's homework done. My client has never been verbally or abusive or controlling. Within her own message where she relays that the parties need to separate and under our Exhibit A, she makes no reference to the issues of control or any concerns regarding my client's parenting. The parties continue to live together after this message was sent without issue. There are simply people that just can't get along and need to dissolve their marriage, but that doesn't mean my client is a bad person. Petitioner moved out of this residence with no notice to my client on November 30th and took the children out of school. My client was, anxi was an anxious father and the only place he knew to turn was law enforcement. The police records show that he wanted to remain amicable and reach an agreement and had no intention of taking the children out of school. Petitioners claim that my client contacted law enforcement to bully her doesn't hold water. My client called law enforcement one time, which the records show, and they made no contact with her whatsoever. She didn't even know that my client contacted law enforcement until we, we submitted that in our responsive pleadings. The evidence shows that my client wasn't driving by her house, wasn't stalking her, wasn't threatening her at the time of separation. Since this time, my client has gone out of his way to avoid any location petitioner may be at um, to further um, defend. He doesn't want to further defend any um, allegations. My client doesn't even know where she's currently residing, so there's simply no stalking behavior taking place. Further, my client had no idea the petitioner even filed this case, let alone requested for the restraining order. Without knowing this action commenced, there was no way that my client could dodge service or be inappropriate or have um, bad acts. There's no evidence to show that petitioner made any attempt to serve my client with the underlying materials once the restraining order was denied. My client was frankly shocked that she was making these allegations when he made the appointment with my office, given the recent ability for the parties to work together in the best interest of the children. Petitioner's um, willingness to lie and mislead the court is seen within her pleadings in the timeline of this case. And I think this is really pertinent to the court's decision regarding parenting. On December 7th, Unbeknownst to my client, petitioner filed her motion for immediate restraining order, claiming that my client was such a danger to the children that she, the ch children should have no contact with my client. The very next day, after the restraining order was denied, petitioner messaged my client with a picture of a proposed calendar that gave my client two to three overnights a week in December. In other words, within 24 hours, she goes from pleading under penalty of perjury that my client should have no time to voluntarily initiating a proposal that gave my client substantial time, again, two to three overnights a week, which is far beyond what she's proposing today. The records clearly contradict petitioner's claim that my client is controlling, hard to work with, or forcing visitation schedule on her. Rather, if the court looks to the ongoing messages, you'll see that, in fact, she is the party proposing the schedule to my client that provides substantial time. The evidence is so clear that I'm frankly frustrated that we, my client has to spend substantial time and money and energy now fighting these claims. There is no evidence that my client was abusing conflict or involving the children. To the contrary, petitioner attempted to negotiate the visitation schedule in front of the children, and my client refused to do so as indicated within his message. It is undisputed that my client has had 17 overnights in January based on the agreement of the parties. Petitioner has been represented since the beginning of January, so again, I don't believe this claim that my client is forcing her to have this visitation um, holds any water. I'm similarly frustrated at the claim that my office somehow cherry-picked messages to mislead the court. Petitioner is not only the moving party, but had the ability to have uh, present any undisclosed messages within her reply declaration. Her failure to do so substantiates the evidence supported by my client is accurate and honest. 
This is a theme that you see throughout Petitioner's declaration where she alludes to things rather than making outright statements as she's tap dancing on the thin line of honesty under penalty of perjury. My client has no intention of manipulating the visitation schedule to avoid paying support. My client had no idea about overnights and certainly didn't tell her he would fake it until he make it so he doesn't have to pay. These, allegations, these alleged statements are false and inconsistent with the law. In reality, the, ev the evidence shows that my client has tried to remain cordial to maintain the party's co-parenting relationship. I really think that in this case, the text message speak for themselves. This historical relationship shows real cordial and honestly, for the best interests of their children, these parties were able to work together on a temporary basis. So again, I'm confused why we are in our current position and we're slinging mud, which only damages the party's relationship first priority and he simply wants to maintain the closer bond he has with the children that he had during the marriage. The children are happy and have adjusted to an agreed 50-50 schedule for the months of December and January after separation. My client continues to reside in the community home and I think that this is also important to know for, the, for a decision of a 50-50 plan. My client continues to reside in Tudo where the children go to school and mother lives in Longview. That is a basis for the reason why she was acquiescing to giving him additional time because all of the children's activities are in Tudo. And she can't be going back and forth. Um, there's no evidence that the children are anxious in my client's home. We submitted pictures and other evidence from third parties saying that the children are happy and healthy and thriving under the current agreed schedule. Um, the parties have agreed that um, the children will have telephone contacts with a non-residential parent. The children are so happy in my client's home, he testifies that they sometimes don't even want to do so, but he's forcing them to call their mother to ensure that this agreement stays in place. In summary, my client is a loving father and the children have a close bond with him and there's absolutely no reason to modify the current schedule that the parties have already agreed to. As Mr. Zaney had indicated, these, part, these children have already been through a lot and they shouldn't be put through more. So we ask the court to adopt the parenting plan as it, our parenting plan as it's consistent with the status quo and in the best interest of the children. I don't believe the facts call for the case in, of our guardian letter in this case, and I was frankly concerned within petitioner's reply declaration that she seemed to want to limit the children's contact with the guardian ad litem if they're so appointed. My client is confident that the children would relay that they're happy under the current schedule. But again, not every case warrants a guardian ad litem. And given the limited resources, I just don't think it's warranted in this case. As to finances for 2023, my client had a gross annual income of $99,994. I divided this by 12 months. That gave my client a gross of $8,332 or a net of $6,362. There was some argument within the reply declaration about my client's retirement contributions. If the court looks to his uh, last pay stuff for 2023, he only contributed $5,800, which is $800 over the statutory maximum. These were decisions that were made during the marriage um, to for financial planning long term, and he couldn't change it. Moving forward, that may be an option, but I can't guarantee that. My client has testifies that he has a budget of $5,700, which includes all of the community expenses that the parties jointly purchased both real and personal property, and these ex were expenses of the marriage. Within Petitioner's reply declaration, she confuses the total amount owed for the ATV with the monthly payment. The parties only owe for the ATV $434, as my client has been paying the roughly $170 payment. Similarly, with the credit card on the line of credit, while they might be in my client's name, they are they were used for the community. She fails to acknowledge that both the line of the credit line of line of credit and the credit card were accrued in April of 2023 because the parties went on a vacation to the Caribbean. Again, my client is agreeing to pay these cards on a temporary basis. As we've seen within the parenting plan, petitioner makes baseless claims that my client is financially controlling. She didn't have information. He's hiding assets. Petitioner, from the statements, the Red Canoe statements alone, show that she had full access to the Red Canoe, Red Canoe Community Credit Union. Um, she was making multiple transfers. She was able to not only access the funds, but she knew what was going on with them. My client shows, and again, a wife was aware, there was no money in the Longshore account. Um, this is associated with the land mortgage, and my client was transferring money from the Red Canoe account to make that payment, but there's simply no money there. She similarly claims that he has other um, accounts through Fiber and Chase. My client had to track, go to these institutions and prove to the court a negative. He simply doesn't have these accounts. We asked the court seriously question the veracity of petitioner's statements given the number of false and basis claims she makes. As to petitioner's income, I do believe if um, Mr. Zandy is indicating um, a 1700 net, as indicated within our declaration, we believe that she has a net income of $1,709. Based on these figures, my client would have a basic support obligation of $1,525 with a deviation that would be $692. My client will already be going into the negative after paying the basic community bills and child support. Even if we 
accept petitioner's financial declaration is accurate, which again, I believe is an estimate because we again, don't know where she's living. Her expenses are covered and more after child support. If the court doesn't find a deviation is appropriate at this point, we ask the court to set a review on support. Again, this is a case like most where there's simply not enough money to go around. This is a low to mid range marriage where petitioner has a duty to support herself and work full time as the children are school age and older. As to the state, I don't believe that this is issue and sh certainly doesn't go to the veracity of my client's statements. She makes further allegations within a reply that my client Ray was not able to respond to. The truth of the matter is, is that the parties had two safes to the property. One safe is my client's and one safe is his friends. The court can order that she has access to the home to see. My client's safe in the community property remains. There has been zero evidence. And again, she's making this baseless assertion, but there is zero evidence that my client has hit assets whatsoever. My client does not have 50 guns. He has not moved community property and the safe and its contents remain, remain at the house. And I'm happy to enter an order to that effect. Lastly, we ask the court to deny attorney's fees. Both parties had to um, borrow money in this case. There's no pot of money here. And frankly, I don't know there was a reason to bring this motion as my client would have been willing to address support and the, the parties clearly were able to um, deal with the parenting plan amongst themselves. Thank you. Anything further? Uh, just, I, I guess the question would be how much money has he given her since December towards family support? And has he ever asked how much the rent is and such? So that's the first thing. Second of all, if we're looking at 401k contributions, those are voluntary. You can reduce that back down to the $417 that the statute uh, permits, and, and I'm sure his attorney was told him that. The basis for the motion is, is pretty obvious. You've got one person saying black, you've got another saying white. Where does the truth reside? We don't know. That's why we ask for GALs to be appointed on that. We want what's in the best interest of these kids. And traditionally, there just has not been uh, mutual uh, involvement with these kids, as uh, Mr. Hansen now conveniently says there has. To sit there and suggest that there has been this agreement between the parties as to uh, visitation schedules again uh, is, is, from our perspective, not what's happened. We've had an individual who says this is what the visitation schedule is going to be for January. Like it or leave it, that's how it's going to be until we get to court. Anytime you have that uh, person exerting that amount of control and dominance over a spouse, obviously that's why we're here. He can't expect my client to live with nothing and just agree with that and like that because that's how she's lived for 13 years or beyond that. You know what's best for the kids? My client, uh, certainly after being a spouse and voted spouse for 13 years, should have some uh, ability to be able to pay her bills, which now are certainly increasing given uh, her very modest income levels coupled with uh, the traditional revenue. It's all supported by statute. That's where we're at, and that's what we're requesting. So I did uh, review the files and record uh, of what has been filed, and uh, what is difficult is uh, one, when you're looking at temporary orders, that's what they are. They're temporary orders uh, and it is to get the party through to either settlement or trial. That's what we're looking at here. There's limited information uh, and uh, so the court looks at those documents and, and tries to uh, make the uh, rulings that best reflect what uh, the court sees. So with that, first off, in regard to the parenting plan, the court does have significant concerns over the allegations by the wife against the husband. Uh, simply because a restraining order was not granted does not decide other factors. The court does have concerns. I say that, and at the same time, I have to look at what may go on between a husband and wife uh, may not be that same relationship with a child. So it starts to get complicated, but I, I look at the full picture, the big picture. Uh, the court has concerns, but with the investigation by a guardian ad litem, the court can take a closer look uh, at it down the line. Meanwhile, the court finds at this time an abusive use of conflict by the father, which will result in some limitations at this time. In regard to the uh, schedule for the father, the court is going to order that the children, uh, that he have the children the first, third, and fifth weekends of the month from Friday at 5 to Sunday at five, the Friday is uh, to determine that weekend time. In addition, the father will have uh, midweek overnights from, uh, I, I'm assuming 
dad gets off around five. I'm not sure. And that's why I'm saying five. So that may I need to get adjusted he, a little he bit. He pulls in at 4.15. Okay. So I'll just say five uh, for now, but that can be adjusted if, if the parties can agree on it. Uh, and then on Wednesdays uh, from 5 p.m. And, and then he would take the children to school. If there's school, if there's no school, uh, then it would be until 5 p.m. the next day. I'm not getting into all the, in re, well, I guess I should say, uh, in regard to the holidays and those kinds of things. Uh, we should I, be able to work that out, I, I imagine, okay. or reserve. All right. All right. Um, I'm not going to get into that. Where I am going to uh, decide at this time is in regard to decision making at this point, I am going to find the limitation and order that the mom uh, have decision-making regarding healthcare and extracurricular activities uh, and that the school educational will be joint. Let me go back to the extracurricular activities. I think at this point, dad's been involved and I don't see any reason it, hopefully the parties can communicate uh, the what's family wizard app or some other app that they can communicate and decide. I think dad's been involved in coaching I want I uh, and be present what I don't if there will be no contact with the mother during that time um so he can do his coaching but no contact with the mother uh so that mom can go to this game uh, <laughs> and then a guardian item will be appointed in in regard to that, who do we have for the next three? Dwight McCory, Anne Height, Eve Wolfs. Mr. I'll strike uh, Anne Height for no other reason than she's got a million cases right now. Okay. Huh. Um, I will strike Keith Lawrence. Okay. So Twyla Corey will be the person appointed as guardian ad litem. Uh, I was thinking she was still on here. No. Uh, and then the payment of the guardian ad litem uh, will be in the same proportion as their incomes. Uh, once the guardian ad litem recommendations are in, this matter can be set back on the docket for further consideration. Oh, she is there. Okay. Uh, Ms. Corey, do you want anything from them at this point or? Uh, actually, I didn't hear anything until I heard my name. I was, oh, okay. <laughs> had forgotten I was still on this actually. Okay. Um, do you want them to message you their phone numbers? Uh, oh, either guess. that or they could appear on the order appointing either way. Okay. All right. We'll just do that. All right. Uh, in regard to child support, the mother's income will be set at $1,735 and 52 cents. The father's income will be set at $6,362.09, or drop the cents off, it doesn't need to be on there. Uh, the child support will be based on these amounts. Uh, the court does find uh, that there is a need for maintenance by the uh, wife. Uh, again, uh, there, as indicated, there's rarely enough money to go around, but at this point, uh, the basic needs of the parties come first. Uh, and so that is what is going to take priority. Uh, there's a need, and the court does believe that the uh, husband has the ability to pay. He has the resources he has uh, to make this uh, happen. So with that, uh, the court is going to order a global amount of 2300 paid by the husband to the wife on the first of each month. The court does want to review in six months. And then uh, as far as the amounts again, well, strike that. So review in six months to see whether it needs to continue or what needs to happen. Uh, in regard to the family home, the husband will continue to live in the home. Use of property. Uh, 
the wife had requested to obtain half of the furnishings and personal belongings and effects on a date certain. Uh, this is always difficult because there's not a list, there's not something. So if the parties want to exchange a list and can agree as to what those items are, uh, then great. Uh, the court's not going to sit here and order it today because I don't have any list to even know. Uh, the parties can agree on it. If not, then the list will need to be uh, made and be put back before the court. Uh, the court does recognize the need uh, to have the item, especially when having the children uh, primarily with her. So the court, uh, again, directs the parties to exchange a list to be reviewed, see if this can be agreed upon. If not, note it back on for the court to make a decision. In regard to that idea, what the court would like to do is have the parties agree on a day, uh, a full day, uh, for the wife to go back into the home and uh, the safe should be open so things can be seen and uh, she can uh, take a look at things prior to making any kind of list. Uh, the order to protect property that will be granted. Uh, the husband will pay the first mortgage, utilities, homeowners, insurance, property taxes, the F-150 side-by-side uh, -side trails. I wasn't quite sure what that was. And Dodge pickup, auto insurance and medical insurance. Wife will pay the Ford Escape. Uh, each is responsible for their future debt from the time of separation and each will pay their credit cards in their name. There will be no change of insurance. As to attorney's fees, again, with the disparity of incomes, the court will order the payment of $3,000 to Chad Zandy within 60 days, uh, but the amount will be reserved for final distribution of properties. And when I'm talking about that, that for this and as well as the maintenance is, I don't know what the overall, um, uh, I guess, properties or uh, what they have. Uh, and so as far as um, cash or those kinds of things, it's obviously um, not limited, but uh, somewhat. So you can look at these things if the matter goes to trial. So this was filed on January 3rd. Do we make a effective start date of the order January 1 for support? Ms. Gilmore? My client has no ability to pay back support. It, I mean, it would, if anything, is just going to be delinquent and out there incurring interest at this point, which isn't good for the community. At this point, it's February 6. I would say early is February 1. You filed it when? January 3rd. Ah, the start date of February 1. Okay. Presentation in three weeks. Yes, the 27th. I think that's it from our perspective. All right, Ms. Gilmore, anything else? I don't have any questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.